All right, we're going to start the uh, April 6th commission meeting. We'll have the invocation by myself. We'll have the Pledge of Allegiance by Commissioner Brentson. Then we'll have roll call. Everybody, please stand. A prayer for our local leaders. Jesus, you were born in a little town. You grew up under the authority of local leaders and officials who manage the majority of your daily life. We lift up our local leaders today. We pray for our mayors, city councils, county commissioners, police chiefs, judges, and all who serve our local communities. Strengthen them with wisdom and grace for the heavy burdens they carry. May they manage their teams and projects with love. Keep their hearts pure and their eyes, eyes turned towards your face as they work in the best interest of the people they are called to serve. Amen. 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 Commissioner Brunson? Here. Commissioner Wilson? Here. Mayor Johnson? Here. Commissioner Firstner? Here. Commissioner Oliver? Here. All right, we'll read something here real quick. Public comment announcement. City Hall is open to the public. However, attendance inside the Okoy Commission Chambers may be limited to accommodate social distancing and is subject to the governor's executive orders. Any interested party may be heard during the public comments and public hearing portions of the meeting. In order to participate remotely, members of the public should call 407-554-7118 or email citizens at okoy.org in advance and indicate the item you would like to address. At the appropriate time during the meeting, city staff will contact you via phone and patch you into the meetings where you can share your comments and our questions. Comments and questions received via email will become public records and provided to the city commissioners in advance of the meeting. Okay, all right. Uh, proclamation, we, we, uh, not reading that tonight, we're giving that to the uh, water department. Jamie Croteau will be picking that up. Staff reports. The only thing I have, Mayor, is um, I think it was two or three meetings ago, we asked for clarification of the residential solid waste rules be included with the city water bill that has been produced and that will be going out with the next billing cycle. All right, okay. All right, let's see. Commissioner's announcements, Commissioner Brinson. Um, I just have one announcement. I am putting together a West Side uh, community safety meeting. It's going to uh, include uh, local law enforcement agencies throughout the West Side of Orange County uh, to include the municipalities uh, I've contacted the school board as well as the county uh, sheriff's office. Uh, I've also contacted FDOT and FHP. They're all on board. So we're planning on doing that possibly on the 28th or so of April. And so I'm going to be asking the commission to uh, allow me to do that in the event center. All right. You Commissioner Wilson. Mm -hmm. Nothing at this time. Commissioner Firstner? Not at this time. Commissioner Oliver? Nothing at this time. Okay. Uh, consent agenda. Do I hear a motion? I'll no, I, I'm sorry, no, I'd like to pull some items from the consent agenda. Okay. It'll be items two, items three, six, and seven. All right. See that leaves one and eight. Four and Let's five. see. And one, four. One, four, five. And four. Four. Seven and eight. Right? Five. Five, five, five also. Do I hear a motion for those to be approved? One, four, five, and eight. One, four, five, and eight. Do I hear a motion for those to be approved? I'll, I'll make that motion. I'll motion, second it. Motion made by Commissioner Wilson, seconded by Commissioner Oliver. Any more comments? If not, let's vote. Motion carries unanimous. All right, Commissioner Brinson. The first item is uh, item two, uh, the contract for sale and purchase. Uh, I have, uh, I'm kind of lost here as far as the sales contract that's depicted in our agenda and the dates and signatures that are on it. So I, I'm going to need some explanation as to 
what that means. We, we purchased, the city purchased a piece of property in 2013 from, um, from Ms. Dunn. Um, as part of that purchase, there was adjacent property um, that she was not uh, at the time ready to sell, but we had negotiated a right of first refusal that at the time she did want to sell that property, we would have the first crack at it. Um, so now she wants to sell, and so she's come to the city, and uh, we're ex we're, we need to decide whether we're gonna exercise our right to purchase that property or not. And so the first step in deciding whether we want to purchase the property is to get an appraisal, um, because part of the contract that we had on that, then we have to negotiate whatever the, whatever the fair price of that property is. So this item was really to come to the city commission to um, city staff believes this is property we, we ought to purchase. Um, and this item is to, to get approval um, to obtain a, an appraisal for the property to start the negotiations on the purchase of the property. Okay, I think that satisfies that for me. Uh, number three, number three. Uh, let's look at number three. Number three, uh, I just wanted to just make sure I'm, I'm clear that appraisal on this property is going to be needed prior to the sale of this property? Yes, sir. Okay. And th this one, the developer has offered to pay for, for That's the appraisal. That's correct. Um, the, uh, develop the offer included their offer to pay for the appraisal, so we would obtain an appraisal on we would send them the bill basically for a reimbursement on that. And um, one other thing I wanted to make clear, just because um, we've had some issues in the past with, with understanding, the, the proposed use according to their offer is a small flex office where they'd be bringing a headquarters. Therefore, um, you have the right to bind them so that they could not change the use without coming back to the commission with this approval if you so chose. Okay, and, and of course, that would have been my second question to my question, uh, is making sure that any any property that we sell, whatever we sell it for, you know, in good faith, that they're using that property to develop accordance to the contract in which we, we've agreed to and signed and ratified. Yes, so, sir. Uh, because, of course, uh, we have all kinds of other implications, include tax implications that go along with changing uh, that and also the uh, uh, zoning for that. Uh, the next one is Seven. item six. Six? Item six is, uh, I just want clarification on this. Also, I, I know I spoke with city staff on this previously, but I want to make sure that uh, we're clear and that this Victims of Crime Act grant uh, that, that's going to be coming forward. Uh, it's uh, if the funding is pulled in 2021, I'm sorry, in 22, uh, is the city looking to uh, fund that, that, that position? Yeah, we anticipate um to get the funding next year, Commissioner, but as we do with all positions every year, um, when we get to the budget process, um, and if that's something you specifically want to know whether that's been funded through the year as part of the decision process to continue with that position, we could certainly, you know, include that or just remember to ask that question one way or the other. Right. We, an we anticipate um, from previous experience um, that we will be able to renew that grant for several years. Right, because that, that, I think that's a good grant uh, that's coming forward, the Victims of Crime Act. Uh, and I think it, it would be prudent upon the city uh, to continue that position, whether it was funded federally or not. Uh, but it is something I would like to see uh, we continue if that funding is pulled at the federal level. Uh, number seven. I'm shaking my head because I, I'm, I'm really uh, need some, some uh, Good vibes on this one. Orange County is uh, in a cost-sharing business with us on the intersection of Fuller's Cross and Akoya Popka Road. But I get, I get there's a, an, a change order that was in that needs to have additional funding for that due to underground utilities. And I guess my question is, uh, I know Orange County 
per our conversation, uh, city manager, that they're they're on the hook for uh, cost sharing up to a million dollars. I understand it. Yes. And so if he, if if that project <clears throat> goes beyond a million dollars, uh, are we going to have to fund it as the city? The way I understand the, the contract was written, and perhaps the city attorney or Steve can correct me if I'm wrong. I think in our um, estimates. We went back to the county once. We originally anticipated we were going to need six or seven hundred thousand dollars from the county. We got the estimates back. We knew it was going to be about a million dollars each. We renegotiated with them, and I think the final contract, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, was they'll reimburse up to a million dollars for that. We're just going to have to, and I believe it's on a reimbursement basis. So we're just going to submit everything to them, and they pay us up to a million dollars. Yes, and it's actually 1.1 million that they're contributing towards the project. And if we exceed a certain amount, it does come back to the city. There's road impact fees designated for any overages or unplanned things like this. But we're, we're looking to control costs as best we can. Right, and, and that's part of it because I know this is probably the first change order on that project. Yes. Uh, but because Orange County is the one who approved those permits for those underground utilities, I, you know, I want to make sure that <laughs> They're not doing things at the county level, and it's, it, you know, we're getting unfunded mandates. To yeah, I don't think they're doing anything nefarious. I think they're just going business as usual. Right. And we right. anticipate, you know, I, I'm a $2 million project. We figured there's probably going to be a change order or two. Um, but, you know, if, it, if things were wildly out of whack and we found some site conditions that were hundreds of thousands of dollars, we would try to go back and renegotiate with okay. them. Yeah, I, just I don't know how sure. successful we would be, but we would try. Right. Well, it's nothing. You know, there's no cost in trying, I guess. But I just want to make sure I'm on the record saying that we, we want to make sure that uh, everyone's paying their fair share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was all. That it? Can you make a motion for them now? Two, uh, three, yeah. two, three uh, six, seven. I do have a question about two. Huh? I have a question about item number two as well. Okay. If, well, if you're done, uh, Commissioner Benson. I am. The, the uh, question I have about item number two, when you look at this, this contract that was put on the agenda, it gives the impression that this is a contract that we're seeking for this property. But then when you go down to the signature block, as you stated, there are signatures on here from 2013, which is Mayor Vandergriff's signature and others who are not affiliated with the city. But as we look at this, so that, that is a, a, obviously an old contract. If we're going to post this on a contract, why don't we post a proposal for a contract as well so it's not so misleading uh, in this agenda? Because, I mean, if, if, if someone just looking at it at face value, it looks as if this is an actual contract. So w is there a possible, when we do things like this, to put, a, um, uh, to put some type of proposal contract to identify or at least explain what this contract is that we're posting up here and what, and what type of contract we're seeking as a result of the uh, of a, of a pr appraisal for fair market value of the property, yeah, Commissioner, my apologies if it wasn't if it wasn't clear. The older contract was included because the older contract set forth the right of first refusal on this adjacent property. So the staff report maybe wasn't as clear as it could have been, but the staff report um, should have indicated that this was for the purchase of the property, the right of first refusal property that was referenced in that prior contract. And we will do that, Commissioner, but we wanted to see if there was an interest in purchasing the, pri the property before we went ahead and had the attorney do that legal work that you're referring to. So I would have I just rescinded this, this contract altogether, taken it off, and just put down at least uh, some type of memorandum as to what we're doing as opposed to putting this uh, possibly misleading contract on this on the agenda. Also, um, I needed to ask about fair market value under section section 15. It states that the fair market value is, uh, which means the price agreed upon by both parties. So, uh, if the property appraises at, let's just say we we're we're, we're looking here at $175,000, and if the property appraised differently, then we have to come to agreement as to what we what we deem to be fair market value. Is that correct? We get the appraisal. If we can't negotiate from the appraisal, we get a satisfactory number between the two parties. She is allowed to get an appraisal, a second appraisal at her expense, and then we negotiate from there. Um, I defer then, to the city attorney what happens yeah. after that. And, we and still then, not agreed. Yeah, so if we don't, if we can't agree after looking at both appraisals, then the two appraisers select a third appraiser. 
Um, and then I think, it, I'd have to double check the contract, but I think we're kind of bound, both parties are bound by the determination of what that third appraiser is, says it is. Okay. But I, but I, you know, these, we don't want to keep going back and forth with appraisals and, and negotiating back and forth. I think we'll, yeah. we'll probably be able to reach an agreement on what the fair market value is uh, before going through all those steps, hopefully with just this first appraisal. Okay, thank you. All right, did we make the motion on the three, two, like three, to, six, seven. I'd like to make a motion to approve items two, three, six, and seven of the consent agenda. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner First. Any more comments? No more comments? Let's vote. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Public hearing, none. First reading of ordinances, none. Second reading of the ordinance, none. All right, I'm going to hand this to you, Commissioner Brunson. All right, under nine, I turned it over to Tim. I'll make a motion under the Mayor Pro Tem for Commissioner Wilson to be the Mayor Pro Tem under item nine. So I'll, I'll make a motion for Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, okay, the Mayor uh, has made a motion that uh, under item nine for the election of Mayor Pro Tem to be Commissioner Wilson. Do we have any comments? I second that. I have a comment. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, as we read the, um, the agenda item here, the way it is set up, um, we did, we had a, um, I want to say with one of our, I want to say our January, one of our January or February meetings that we discussed having this uh, play out where it just will simply be, it will go one, two, three, sure. according to our commission. So hopefully we can put that in our verbiage next year as to how it actually, how we do it. But yeah, I agree uh, that we should do it that way. And uh, I th I'm hoping that we can just I think it's so there's no confusion. We just kind of put the verbiage in in uh, in our agenda uh, for next year that states that that's exactly how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Also, that's, yeah, that's I also think it's in our in our ordinance or uh, on our stuff for how it's yeah. I think we just, we've kind of done it by policy the last yeah. time. Um, kind of established the. We kind of did a verbal comment to do that where we yeah. went. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Commissioner Brunson did reach out to me and I did do some research and that was the decision that was made for the CRA board for the chairperson yeah. po position. CRA, I think yes. that it seems that yeah. if that's the policy you're looking to do for this, I can make sure it's noted. Um, if that's the consensus that from now forward you're looking to have. Yeah, and it is. Yeah. 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 That's that worked what out. we said. worked out very well. Yeah, okay. We, we have a motion that's been made and probably seconded by Commissioner Firstner. All in favor? Please vote. Second vote. Yeah. <laughs> Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Your last duty as mayor pro tem. <laughs> dropping it. They get to hit the gavel. <laughs> one, more, one more. We've been all standing. Up. Okay. All right. Now we get down to the uh, number ten appointment of commission liaisons to various boards. Melody, Melody, do you want to handle that? Do we go through it or we want everybody to talk about it? <laughs> everybody put in, what do you want? We go to the first one, it's Parks and Recreation Board. Well, Mr. Mayor, Mayor before, before we go there, can, can we go back to number nine? Number and nine. Do we need to get a consensus on how we're going to do elect uh, Mayor Pro I think we've, we've already we approved that. Okay. We did, we got the consensus. We okay, did. Okay. It's, I think you still have to elect it, but we put it in the verbiage that it's how we said it goes in, in the order. Okay, all right. We, if anybody want to change, I'm, I'm on, uh, I, I on like the, to uh, give, them, give me a minute to finish here. Under the, uh, hang on. Let's see here. Right. Oops. Okay, under the, uh, what was it? Under the uh, Human Diversity Board, I'm on, I'm getting off. That's uh, that's up for up for grabs there. So, so let's start at the first one: Parks and Recreation Board. Commissioner Wilson. I would like to remain on that board. Anybody have a problem with that? All in favor of consensus? 
Do we need to vote on that, Scott, or just consensus? Yeah, I, I think in the past we've kind of gone through them and then voted one time. All right. All right, Commissioner Wilson wants to stay on that one. We go to Citizens Advisory Board for the Police Department. That's Commissioner Oliver. I would like to change. You want to change? Yeah, I would like to make a change. All right, let's. All right, let's. Who wants to be on the Citizens Advisory Police Department? Uh, Commissioner Brinson would like to sit on that board. Commissioner Brinson. All right. All right, let's go to the next one. Citizens Advisory Board for the Fire Department. Commissioner Firstman. Yeah, I'd like to stay on that. All right, that's good. Human Relations Diversity Board. All right, who wants to be on that? That's the one I would like to sit on. Who? I would like to sit on that board. Commissioner. All right, Personnel Board. Commissioner Brinson. I'd like to be on one of those. If you're changing, you're going over to the uh, uh, advisory for the police department. I'd like to try the personnel board. By all means. <laughs> okay. Okoy Youth Council, Commissioner Oliver. I'd like to stay on that board. All right. Tri County League of Cities, Commissioner Wilson. I'd like to stay on that board. All right. West Orange Airport Authority. Do we still need that? I don't think we still need that. They never they meet. Exist? I don't think they meet. I don't, think they, I don't think they are. Yeah, they're not. But if they do have a meeting, it's probably best to have someone appointed already. We'll just so we leave don't them. have to have a special meeting that? for that. Commissioner Oliver? They, they still meet when? I don't think they've had a meeting in quite a while, but you never know. If the state comes up with some impetus to, you know, place an airport somewhere, they might fire up and start having meetings again. And then we wouldn't have a representative. We would have to have a special meeting. Well, I guess to I'll, I'll stay on it. They have so met in three years, but I'll, I'll, I'll stay on it, though. <laughs> All right. They, they, did, they probably had a meeting right before you got on the board. That was the first one in probably a year or two. Right. So. Gotcha. Yeah. West Orange Chamber of Commerce. I would, would like to stay manager. on that, Mayor. Right. All right, Education Incentive Board, Commissioner Brinson. I can stay on there. All right. Metro Plan, Orlando Municipal Advisory Committee. You want to stay on that, too? I'm there. Okay. All right. Now we need to vote. Everybody's got, we got the names all on there. Do we just say aye for everybody? Vote? No. Huh? I think so. It's everyone stays the same except for Citizens Advisory Board. Commissioner Oliver is off. Uh, Commissioner Brinson is on. Human Relations Diversity Board, Mayor Johnson is off, Commissioner Oliver is on, and Personnel Board, Commissioner Brinson is off, and Mayor Johnson is on. All right, we hear a motion for those. Police, you, the, you missed the police department. That was the first one. That was the first one. Said first first? Said, I'm sorry. Good. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Just what I want. You're talking about the police and fire department. Well, I, no, I want to make sure because we have. Uh, you said the fire department. Right? Police department. Did police get, department is Commissioner Brinson. Right, that was a change. That was. Yeah. Did, did you mention that one? Yeah. Scott, okay. Sorry, I, I didn't hear it. The mask. You want to read them out one more time and then we'll vote. <laughs> All of them remain the same except the Citizens Advisory Board for the Police Department. Commissioner Oliver is off. Commissioner Brinson is on. Human Relations Diversity Board, Mayor Johnson is off. Commissioner Oliver is on. And the Personnel Board, Commissioner Brinson is off. Mayor Johnson is on. All right. All right, do I hear a motion? I'll make that motion. Motion made by Commissioner Wilson. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Oliver. Let's vote. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Staff action items. Nothing further, man. All right. Now we're going to go to the comments from the public, for which we have some comments here. I will start. We'll start off with uh, Mr. Uh, Malou comes in front. It's five minutes, and then we do three minutes for the uh, people that want to do afterwards. Five minutes to start with. Okay. Good evening. My name is Pastor Scott Bolivo. I'm the founder of Matthew Stone Ministries, and I've served in West Orange County for 20 years. Excuse me. Can, can you come over to the microphone? Sorry, I just apologize. <laughs> As I was saying, my name is Pastor Scott Ballou, and I'm the founder of Matthew's Hope, and I've served West Orange County for over 20 years. For those that need to know, my theology is conservative, and I also have social conscience and let scripture guide my actions. I come to you this evening as a former homeless person and drug addict, neither that have anything to do with the other. I have learned much in my last 11 years since I started Matthew's Hope as a nonprofit, giving a hand up to those who were looking for a life of independence and self-sustainability. 
I have learned a lot in that time, in my time of being homeless, that there is no one face of homelessness. And you would be able to look around, but if you went outside, you would see that today. I do not profess, nor do I pretend to have all the answers. However, I do bring raw experience and credibility of serving the community for over two decades as someone who has faced some of the very same challenges as these other human beings are facing. As recently as May 2019, I warned the local media that we should be preparing for homeless tsunami, and that tsunami is now upon us. The pandemic has simply accelerated, accelerated this to fruition sooner than expected. Soon the rental moratorium will be lifted and more average families and individuals will be forced to their cars and onto our streets. This will create a third drive of homelessness, joining rapid development, COVID-19, and the absence of a thoughtful planning of something that has been existed, has existed in West Orange County for years. The homeless of our community are being forced onto our streets, and I do not blame the property owners, I do not blame the developers, I do not bl blame anyone. In fact, what I do know is that if we remain the status quo and do nothing, we will simply lose the beauty and quaintness of our community and most so, more so mirror what you will see in other growing metropolitan areas. Here's some quick facts. Florida ranks number three in the entire country for the number of homeless people in our state. Florida's number one fastest growing homeless population in the United States, and Central Florida is the fastest growing homeless population in all of Florida. Just let that sit with you for a minute to think about. Some believe this growth is due to transients coming here for the weather, and I beg and differ with that, to beg and differ with you and respectfully disagree. The truth is that most of these people have ties to our community. They grew up here, they went to our schools, they own homes, they pay taxes, and even have had subdivisions named after their families. And then something along the way went terribly wrong, derailing their lives. A death of a spouse, an illness, or some other traumatic event. I hear often how we think of home, off homeless people are lazy drug addicts or mentally ill. I assure you, this, is not, this perception cannot be further from the truth. In fact, many were not addicted before becoming homeless but in fact became homeless and then became addicts. I promise you this, if you were to experience a major traumatic loss, you too may feel like you were in shock and could do nothing to help yourself. Our ministry has had pastors, teachers, firemen, business owners, and even a NASA engineer that have come through our doors that have fully recovered. The reason I'm here tonight is simply to ask one question. What do we want our community to look like in the next 12 to 36 months? I cannot offer a clear proposal or even begin to explain a plan to address some of these immediate challenges in a five minute talk. I can simply come here hoping that tonight opens some thoughts and opens some doors. I am hoping that our elected public servants and those hired to serve our community will come to together to develop a triage plan for what is currently unfolding in our community and from there develop long-term plans while engaging other local municipalities. Matthews Hope will gladly help if asked. Our success, our, we believe that the success of this happening is going to be the local municipalities and to various levels of government officials, both county and citywide, to make it work. You cannot arrest homeless away. You cannot just run them off. And ar arresting with silly camping laws to eradicate homelessness and just a waste of taxpayer dollars. They're arrested, they're taken to the 33rd, jail, fed, and sheltered on taxpayer dollars for three days, only to return from exactly where they came from. And anyone who believes this is, this is good, right, clearly is apathetic to the challenges we face. And finally, in closing, and I want to remind that I didn't start over here, I cannot close without addressing the recent displays of chauvinism, bigotry, and racially insensitive comments and bullying tactics recently deployed by your mayor. It was and it is shocking. Time restrictions do not permit me to expand further. However, I have nothing to hide, nothing to gain by saying this, except that sometimes it's harder to do what is right than what is to do what is easy. That said, Mr. Johnson, enough is enough. Okay, Your thank behavior you. is not only disrespectful, but to those who call themselves public servants, Time's they up. stop. Time's up. Okay, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Moore, Commissioner Moore.
Good evening, Council. Uh, Orange County Commissioner Christine Moore, 201 South Rosalind, Orlando, 32802. Uh, I saw many of these conversations and things occurring online, and so tonight I brought with me Donna White, the Division Manager of Mental Health and Homelessness, and I understand Dewey Wooden from the Healthcare Center for the Homeless is here as, as well. And I can tell you the, the problem in the northern part of District 2 with homeless has escalated, and recently, um, the mayor of Apopka in his group, he has a citizens group uh, com comprised of about 12 churches that is working to try to begin a drop-in center. They toured the drop-in center on the east side with, with Mrs. Weish, and it was very enlightening. So I brought her here today just to begin and open up a dialogue of the alternatives and things that the, the county can provide if you choose to partner and deal with the homelessness situation here in Okoe in a more developed or dramatic way. And if it's all right with you, uh, Mr. Mayor, may I bring my guests up? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We add her time to yours. We can add her three minutes to your time. I'm done because she's okay. the expert. I'd rather you hear from her. Thank you, Commissioner. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, I, I have to agree with Scott on many of his uh, comments regarding the homeless. Many uh, on our streets are there from traumatic issues that have really caused their mental illnesses and their addiction. Many have been, uh, unfortunately, um, have lack of access to a lot of services. So I, I believe that the issues and the concerns that we have with our chronically homeless on our streets we have to um, appeal to an, a number of things that we do in Orange County government, which is look at the best practices for trying to get individuals off the street, which is uh, identifying them, outreaching to them, building relationships with them. Drop-in centers are very critical to pulling people in and getting them on the list for housing. We have a, a system in Orange County through our coordinated entry system and our, our lead agency and many of our providers. But quite frankly, um, Pastor Scott says true. There aren't enough resources to, to deal with all the problems we have. It's if you push the balloon one way, it bulbs the other way. So if you move them off one piece of property, they have nowhere else to go but another piece of property. So we have to really address this in in a linear fashion, address it through the many things that we know work in regards to homelessness. It's not wrong that um, what we're seeing now is an increase in chronic homelessness. There will be an increase in family homelessness when moratorium and eviction is lifted. We're trying to work as much as we can on the front end of prevention and diversion for families and those first time, <coughs> excuse me, folks coming into homelessness. But if we don't have the resources and the necessary housing and the necessary supports for people with their mental illness and their addiction and the relationships that, that we need to, to build, then it's gonna be very difficult to, to change that trajectory for those individuals. We're seeing more families, the, the rise of single women with children because of the, the extra impact on women uh, because of low wage earning and single mothers with, with families coming into homelessness. So if we're going to, to tackle this, it really is going to take every facet of the business sector, the private sector, uh, and government to, to handle this. Government can't do this alone. There, there's no way. Uh, Washington, D.C. is not going to do it. Yeah, this started, I will tell you what I believe, and I've been in this field a very long time, I believe this started with deinstitutionalization back in the 70s and 80s when there were institutions that would take care of people, but they were asylums and they were terrible. So we thought we'd do a better job with community mental health, but we didn't. Uh, as always happens, we have a good plan in place and then that plan falls apart somewhere along the way and the safety net was lost. So I will tell you that we have a lot of work to do and it's not easy work and um, it's a multi-pronged approach. Thank you. We'll ask some questions at the end. All right. All right, I'm going to call on the, uh, I have some forms here. We'll start with uh, Shelly Bradford from Winter Garden, Florida. 
come in. You have three minutes. Is she out in the lobby? have had homelessness in my family. My uncle was homeless. He had a mental instability that stemmed from serving our country. He would get trespassed, moved to the next location, and then he would be at, there, at that location for a few days until he was trespassed or arrested. And as it's been said, homelessness cannot be arrested out of a person. Driving to work, I myself see people sitting and sleeping on the sidewalks on 50 in Ocoee. How did they get there? Where did they come from? Where are they going? What is their story? Has anybody taken any time to ask? You may see a homeless person. I see someone who is broken. A soul that needs a little, a little encouragement and maybe, just maybe, help to get them back on their feet. We look at these people and into their eyes every day. We see who they are, not what they are. Being homeless is not what defines a person. It, is, it just happens to be the situation that they're in. I see someone's father, someone's mother, someone's brother, someone's sister, or someone's child. I have children with disabilities. My children are fortunate enough to have parents that have resources that are gonna be able to take care of them for the rest of their lives, hopefully. Not all people with disabilities have th these resources and have ended up homeless through no fault of their own. Matthew's Hope is equipped to help these people. We have come to this community to help these people. As our country was closed, we have been passing out masks, hand sanitizers, hand sanitizers to help with the pre prevention of COVID-19, bringing hot meals and hygiene items to them. As Matthew's Hope, we see a need to continue to help them help themselves by placing porta potties and trash, re trash receptacles in areas so that they can be so that they can pick up their own trash. We would require um, these people uh, to be, to, and hold them accountable to pick up their own trash. Um, but we would need um, people to pick up, we would need you guys to pick up the dumpsters and, and clear it out so they can continue to be held accountable. They need to be treated as individuals, not clumped together. On March 23rd, Scott Blue and I sat down with Mr. Johnson. We were told we needed to bring this idea forth to the local community commissioners. Mr. Johnson suggested and encouraged we have all city commissioners, mayors, managers, and the surrounding cities including, included into this conversation. We were told we needed three votes and that he would back the idea um, that we brought to him with porta potties and the dumpsters. He knew we were having a Zoom call on April 1st. With community leaders, the call um, was to be about this very issue. He said he was aware of it and that he would be on the call and reassured us that we had his support. I personally was an attendee on the call. Want me to stop? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I will comment on, this, on the comments when we get through, and the commissioners will too. They want to. All right. Next is uh, Charlene DeWitt from Oveda, Oveda, Florida. Is that you? No, I didn't get. No one came to Well, I'm, if everybody's going to talk about the same thing, we need to come to a, a number here because we don't need to keep making the same comments. You know, if it's for the same thing and the same comments, let's see if we can move along without going through all the different things on the issues. So Especially, far my comment is different. Huh? So far my comment is okay. Different. Okay. And I can be really quick. Huh? And I can be really quick. Well, hand it up to the city clerk. That's Charlene, Charlene DeWitt. I'm going to yield my time to, we have other people that I prefer to speak before myself. I've got a list here. The only ones that are going to speak are the ones I've got here. So. 
who else are you talking about? So, if it's all about the same thing, I mean, let's well, let's move along. But it's, but it's different views. I know. I got, I got other people out there on the other side, too, wanting to talk also. So, okay. go ahead and come up and talk. Good evening, everyone. 57 years old, United States veteran, disabled, homeless. Do you know someone like this? Wife, daughter, sister, aunt, granddaughter, niece, homeless. Do you know someone like this? Female, 40 years old, recovering meth addict, trying to stay clean and sober, working to support herself and her 16-year-old transgender child, homeless. Do you know someone like this? Black, transgender, white, heterosexual, Asian, homeless. Do you know someone like this? Grandson, grandfather, husband, brother, son, uncle, nephew, homeless. Do you know someone like this? Male in his early 60s, legal immigrant, hardworking laborer, when he can find work, homeless. Do you know someone like this? All that I have mentioned here tonight are in the camps in Ocoee, Florida. One of our homeless guests, Randy, who has some, some mental challenges and lived with his parents up until recently, when his parents both died, he lived with his sister who passed shortly after. Randy is now homeless. In a conversation with Randy, we were talking about a camp that was trespassed. This sweet man's reply was, and I quote, that's terrible. The homeless need somewhere to stay too. Maybe we should all be listening to Randy. I ask you as local officials to come alongside your neighboring towns, cities, and your local nonprofits to discuss and help explore new avenues to help with our, our homeless crisis in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Frankie Gallo. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Same topic, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit differently. Um, I've been a pastor for 30 years, ordained minister for 30 years. I started in New York City, Times Square area, so it's a little bit different there when I'm dealing with homeless people that is in Ocoee, Florida. I've been a little league coach here in Ocoee, and I've uh, owned several houses prior to my divorce. I'm now in Winter Garden. But um, I used to sit at Stark Lake and drink coffee before the, the great renovation every, that, that was done here when Mayor Scott was around. And uh, I'd sit there and read or sit there with a the Bible and People named Kenny and Angel came over and sat with me, and I shared the coffee. After a couple of months of sharing coffee on a Saturday morning, it turned into 15, 20 people sharing coffee with me. A couple of more weeks it went by, I had about 30 people, probably half homeless, half community members, just sharing a cup of coffee in the gospel of Jesus Christ. On my fridge now, I now live on site at Matthew's Hope. I'm a pastor there. On my fridge is probably a good 30 letters from those people that I had coffee with years ago here in, at Bill Breeze Park in the city of Ocoee, telling me, thank you for not giving up on me. These were people that most would say they're drunks, they're drug addicts, they're not like us, they're different. But all I did was take a little bit of time and get to know them one-on-one. -on -one. And they started emptying out the garbage on their own. Paid, this guy named Pedro would go to the ball field and pick up cigarette butts underneath the bleachers. Back then you could smoke at the little league fields. Little things like that. And I'd be like, why are you doing that? They treat you like garbage. This is my community too, is what Pedro would say. I live here too. So remember that when you see somebody sleeping in the woods by a dumpster. Geez, they're, they're all around you. You can't miss them. Remember that they're part of this community and your neighbor too. And the Bible does say Say, love your neighbor as yourself. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is Bill Chambers still out in the back? No. Uh, he was here to speak on the... Not out there? No, sir. Okay. 
All right. Sherry Easley and Alva Easley Claremont. Hi everybody, my name is Sherry Easy Easley and this is Olivia Easley. We are what it looks like to be homeless in 2017. When I was married for 30 years, he walked out on me and I had three children and I didn't know what to do. I was in a motel room and that's where I, the, my next step was to move into Matthew's Hope. I stayed in Matthew's Hope for two years and they taught me life skills they taught me how to process life problems instead of it being overwhelming. They broke it down in pieces and they helped me learn how to solve each and every problem individually until I learned how to solve them on my own. Now I've transitioned out of the program a little over three and a half years ago. I owe Matthew's Hope my life. They've taught me how, who I am. For 30 years I saw through my husband's eyes. Uh, when I got into Matthew's Hope, they taught me how to see through my eyes. So I'm a success story of being homeless. And I want everyone to know that we can be helped. We do, all we need is hope. All we need to know is to be taught how to process whatever life is thrown at us that we couldn't process it. So I ask you today, I mean, when I had Olivia, when I was in the program, I didn't know how to take care of her financially. I'm getting older. I'm 53. Um, she's 25, so what am I going to do? Because when I was younger, I was raised in foster homes and group homes, so I don't have a family. It's, it's me or nothing. So they, when I met with my advocate every week, she taught me how to advocate for my daughter, how to advocate for my family and I went to Special Hearts Farm, it's an adult day training program, and went to enroll her there. They wind up hiring me there as well. We've been there for a little over three and a half years. Um, I still am a single mother, I have to work two jobs, but I'm not scared to do that anymore. When I was homeless, it was just overwhelming, it was just too much. And Matthew's Hope really taught me how to not look at it as overwhelmingly, that I can do it. And it's been three and a half years and we're doing great. So when I look at homeless people now, I'm like Shelly, I don't look at the homeless, I look at what got them there. What situation in their life got them there? M mine, it was a divorce. I didn't know how to process it. I had three kids and one disability, I didn't know. Matthew's Hope held my hand for two years and said, this is what you need. You need to do this, 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 this. And I was able to pay my debt off. I'm debt free now. Um, and I, I know how to budget. And I just think that Matthew's Hope is a great program. And so when you see all these homeless people on the street, don't give up on them. Thank There's you. hope, there's hope. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie, want a garden? I can't get that last name. Is it Charles? Charlotte Boy. Huh? Charlotte Boy. Charlotte Boy. Okay. Yes. Hi. Thank you for your time. I just wanted to let you know that there's a lot of folks in the community that are very interested, um, very concerned about this topic, and there is a petition that's going around on social media that we will get it printed out, and it's um, it's actually a letter to all of the leaders, just requesting some assistance and just making the statement that we, as a community, as residents, are very concerned and we want to help be part of the solution along with Matthew's Hope and a lot of other er other folks in areas and I just wanted to let you know that that petition is going around and it will be sent in to you guys probably next week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Raymond Burgos. Start reset the clock. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Ramon Burgos. I've been uh, living here in Okoye since 2009. I also grew up here uh, as a child for five years. Well, anyway, uh, 2017, I lost my mother. 2018, I became homeless. Um, 2000, I, I worked very hard, uh, did everything I could, and I brought myself out of it through working multiple jobs. And so my thing is, uh, the Matthews Hope, they're a good uh, organization, but they need, I mean, me personally, I think it's all on each individual. Um, if a homeless person goes on to private property and starts destroying it, that's on that individual. It's not uh, the property owner's uh, responsibility to take care of that person. It's each individual person needs to sit there and claim responsibility. And it's like um, property owners should not have to sit there and subject themselves to someone coming on their property and making a can. If they ask them, then that's okay. I personally have gone into uh, these camps and cleaned up the areas where they left trash that fills up 20 yard dumpsters. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's one thing, like me personally, when I lived homeless, I slept in a chair, threw a tarp over myself, and I picked up all my crap every day and put it in the, and went to work. I mean, it, it's not an excuse to say I have mental issues. Everyone has mental issues. I have health issues. It's like, um, you know, you have to deal with that. Uh, it's great to ask for help if the help is there. That is the biggest problem. There is not a lot of help out there to get. And it's because there is a lot of this going on. There is also, um, my biggest thing is there is also uh, public property around that has private, it says no trespassing uh, on it. And that, me, me personally, I'm like, how can a city owned area have no trespassing and saying that stay out, but yet, it's brought before this committee to sit there and uh, say for private individuals to allow these people in. It, it seems to me that if it's a public area, they should be able to stay there. And now, granted, not camp out and live there, but stay there overnight and leave in the morning, go do something productive with your time. That's just my point of view with this, and I thank you for letting me express my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, before we, uh, I got some more public comments, but they're not about this issue. So before we start, um, and I'll, I'll let's talk some questions, we'll ask a few questions. Uh, let's go back a couple of things. I'm not going to get in a, a, a lot of dis disputes or talking about somebody. I don't go on Facebook. I have somebody that goes on Facebook that tells me things that are on Facebook, but I try not to go on Facebook. I have never been on Facebook or, or this WhatsApp or what, what's it called? Next door? Next door? I don't go on that kind of stuff. As a mayor, it wouldn't be, would not be, to my thinking, a person, even a preacher or a mayor or a person running an organization shouldn't be doing things on Facebook and saying the things they say. First of all, I will talk to the lady that was here a while ago from uh, it works for Scott. I did meet him in my office. I was as nice as could be. I told him if they can get three votes at a commission and the citizens who own the property to agree to that, I would go along with it. But that is if there's three votes up here and the citizens who own those properties, I would go along with it. And that's exactly what I said. And I'm not going to get into a lot of discussions about this. I, I, it seems like you, People want to attack you, but I'm not a bully at anything except what I think believe in, and I do bully for that. But I also believe in helping people. I always have. I've done it a lot. I work for different organizations and different things to do that. But I would find it to me to be a, a guest at people making comments that say you're racist or you're a bully because you made a phone call to tell him that it's against the law to talk to somebody on the phone when there's another commissioner on the phone. Now, I called back to Orange County to double check. Nothing against you. I don't know who asked. Commissioner Oliver was on there. But I told him I was getting off. 
because you cannot be on the phone and talk together on an issue that could come just like it is here, come to us to talk. And that's exactly what I said. And listen, folks, my wife was sitting right in the vehicle with me when I said it. Never said a racist comment. That's stupid. Never said any bully in the park. I just said the same thing. I talked to Mike Bohoffer in Winter Garden. I talked to John Reese from Winter Garden. I've talked to uh, two of the commissioners from Winter Garden, and we're all on the same thing. We want to help. But I will not be threatened or pushed into doing something and try to use the title or something when I'm not, that's not going to be the way to get it. I will tell you again, if these commissioners up here talk to the landowners and the landowners want to do it, the landowners have to approve it of their property. That's who I'm elected to represent, the city of Okoy, city of Okoy landowners. That's who I represent, and that's who I'm going to represent. I'm going to read a letter to you when I'm sent. He's in Newport Ritchie. To the Honorable Mayor Rusty Johnson and Commission, it has come to my attention that there is a movement to place dumpsters and porta potties on our privately owned property located at 450 Okoy Apopka Road, Okoy, Florida. I must begin by stating this is something that we cannot allow for liability reasons. I am aware of the homeless situation. I have tried to work with them for years. However, they refuse to leave. In the past, I have placed posted signs and no trespassing signs, which they tore down. I have had the police, on numerous occasions, issue trespass warnings, and they still remain. The police have placed signs stating that trespassers must vacate within 10 days, yet they remain. They even tore down the signs and put up their own signs that read, enter at own risk. These people have absolute zero respect for others' property or the police. This type of behavior is totally unacceptable. I want these trespassers removed. I am very aware of their situation and I have compassion for their situation. However, they're squatting on private property, ignoring the wishes of the owners and all attempts by the police to resolve the matter and continue to break the law is not acceptable. Therefore, I would like to suggest what I feel is a better temporary solution to the situation. The location will certainly accommodate many more homeless and their campsites in a much safer environment. Dumpsters and porta potties would be no problem and there would not be a private property owner's liability issue. It is a short walking distance uh -oh, to the Christian Service Center where they can shower and be fed. This location would be a win-win situation for all current property owners involved and would ensure the safety of the homeless. I strongly suggest this piece of property be used until a more permanent location can be determined. The property I am speaking of is located at Blueford and McKee, the old Harold McGuire property, which is owned by the city. If this property is for some reason not acceptable, hopefully you can locate another city-owned property that accommodate their needs and a permanent location can be determined sincerely. C. Roger Freeman. All right. So, once again, I think in, in, in dealing with people, uh, a lot of people has called me, talked to me, and I, as I told them, and some other owners, I'm not against if the vote goes and the commission would make a motion to do something of that order, but you still got to go to the owners of the property. And if the owners of the property agree to it, and if the city wants to do that, I don't have a problem. But it has to be with the owners agreeing to it. Uh, all right. All right, commissioners, questions or discussion? Well, uh, this is a big one. Because obviously, and I think I spoke about homelessness right when the COVID-19 was was, yeah. was kicking off because I could see it. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. Don't look at this. But I knew that this would happen I, um, because it is what it is. Homelessness, I've traveled all over the world. And every country I've been in, which is quite a number of them, have homelessness. Uh, but this pandemic caused a lot. And I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was just going to exacerbate the situation. So. I do believe that it's something that uh, we have to, to address uh, in partnership. Uh, I'm not sure if Matthew's Hope and all the other needs-based uh, entities out there and organizations are partnering, uh, especially with the, because uh, uh, I'm military as well. So when we start talking about 
VA, at the federal level, VA, at the state level, VA, at the county level, and other uh, uh, service organizations, are we partnering with them? I think that the government has to play a part in this, uh, just by virtue of their and our city limits. What that part will be, I think, you know, is up to discussion. Uh, we, you know, our municipality is a, a, is a good size, but we don't have uh, uh, <laughs> a, 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 a bottomless well of money available. But well, I guess one of the, the number one questions I'm going to have is, do we have ordinance right now in the city that addresses homelessness and or camping on private property? And that's something we have to just because that, even if we had a consensus, it still would have to change that ordinance to allow that to happen. Uh, and so that's that's one comment. And I, I mean, I can go on and on. But one of the, another issue. Uh, I wanted to address was well, not an issue, but it's an invitation to Matthew. So, and I'm going to talk about this a little later. Is uh, I'm putting together a West Side uh, community safety meeting, and I, I think it would be prevalent that you be there to, uh, to speak to that, uh, to your issue. And uh, I can go on, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop okay. there. No. Many of you know I do work for the Christian Service Center here in Ocoee. And we do see homeless, and I do understand the situations that were, that we has been addressed tonight. Um, I also understand the mayor when you say that we have property rights or individuals, that I've had many cases in my district that folks have not wanted someone setting a camp up behind their house, um, setting fires. Um, and we understand property rights, individual property rights. And we do have an ordinance because I believe code enforcement has that to enforce when they are approached by a homeowner um, or a property owner that they ask code enforcement to <coughs> enter into that issue or residents do. Um, I will just say, as for the Christian Service Center, when Mr. Freeman addressed yes. it, um, we do have showers. We offer showers twice a week to individuals to come in. Um, we provide lunch. We pro provide lunch to about 125 to 150 people a day. So again, when you say the numbers are there, the numbers are there. People are hungry. Um, we are not a residential facility, so people do leave after they have pro after we've provided services. We have clothing. So again, I am aware of the situation and. Um, I would love to know more answers. Again, I think we've got a lot to investigate, and um, it's not something that's going to be solved tonight. It's not going to be solved tomorrow. It's going to take effort on the community and of the social service agencies. We've heard from Orange County. And so, again, um, I think that we've heard a lot tonight, and I think it's kind of sets us to think about what's going on and to understand, and I think we do understand. I think all of us see folks who are who don't have a home sitting on the side of the streets, et cetera. But again, I think it's a community effort. As you always said, it takes a village. Well, it does take a village. And um, addressing the issue tonight is kind of a start. So I think I'll just move it on. I agree. There are no quick answers. There's uh, nothing that any of us can come up with tonight to solve the situation. But we have to work on it. We can't just marginalize these homeless people and move them somewhere else so we don't have to look at them or think about them. Unfortunately, that's what most of us do. The governments and the businesses and the property owners, you know, let them go someplace else and be someone else's problem. Well, there are brothers and there are sisters, and we need to help them. We have to find a solution. And there's a lot of resources in the community, private, public. And I think we need to do something formally to come up with some answers. Uh, no one has all the answers, but I think if we all put our heads together, we can come up with a lot of the answers to a lot of the problems. And some may not be that difficult to solve. Uh, there are brothers and our sisters out there, and, and we do need to help them instead of finding way to move them somewhere else. That's not anyone's answer. So I would be more than willing to serve on a, a task force, a committee, or even individual meetings with anyone if uh, 
we can get those established, I'd be happy to uh, participate in that and try to find some kind of solution. Mr. Oliver. The Bible says that uh, the needy, the hungry, the homeless will always be among us. No matter what we do, they will always be there. And it's going to be our responsibility to be our brother's keeper, to do what we have to do with the resources that we have to help them. Pastor Scott, I have a couple of questions for you. If you can come to the podium, please. I do have a couple of questions for you. As he's, as he's coming to the podium, uh, I, I've, I've heard the term tonight, um, I understand. Well, guess what? I don't understand because I've never been homeless. So I can't understand it. Never been there. I can only imagine what it would be like to wake up one morning and my family's gone. No, no, no wife, no children, no grandparents, no uncles, no aunts. It's just me on the streets. I can only imagine what that might feel like. And I say this, when I think about that and I imagine that, it almost brings tears to my eyes to think that what I just said is just words out of my mouth, but someone, that is someone else's reality. Someone's living that reality right now. And Pastor Scott, I asked you to come back up here because I had a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, on, on, on that call that, that I had the, uh, the honor and the privilege to be on for a few minutes um, and, and, and to address the issue of any uh, sunshine laws being broken, uh, when I got on that call, there was no indication that there was another elected official from McCoy on that call. There was no list of names on the participants there. So I listened and I spoke for a brief few minutes, few, few moments until Mayor Johnson came on. And when I heard his voice, I, de I quickly declined and yielded any time that I had and got off that call in the interest of operating in the sunshine. So the question I have for you is, um, you mentioned the word triage. Yes, sir. I want to know what does that mean? What does that look like for what we're dealing with here in the city from the, the homeless standpoint? How do we triage that? And triage is just simply just a, a fancy French term of how to put a little bandage on it until we figure out where do we go from there. Kind of is. Because here, here's the thing. Uh, I've been watching this growing here in this community for the 30 years I've been in it. And what's happened is basically for 30 years we've played musical chairs with homeless people from one place to the other. And all that's happened with COVID, what it did is it created with an overdevelopment with no plan of dealing with that development. We knew these people were in the woods. That was not the question is, what's gonna happen when there are no woods? And then you have Orlando pushing the homeless to the suburbs, which no longer have the woods. And it's just this never ending cycle. And what we were trying to suggest, the biggest issues that, that the mayor had said to me over and again was about trash. And he suggested that I give trash bags out. And we do that. Here's the problem. There are rats and raccoons that get the trash bags and then they throw the trash all over the place. So I suggested that what would it look like if we approach the property owners, and this may not be the answer, but I'm trying to create the conversation. If we approach the property owners and say, hey, here's what happens. We go out there, we say, you know you have homeless people on your property. 99.999% of the time they go, yes, we do. Do you have a problem with them? Not really, most of them don't. Not until all of a sudden they feel, and they aren't gonna put this in a letter, but I can tell you, I've talked to the same people, they feel harassed by code enforcement about the trash. And then they get fined, and then they start getting fined, and all of a sudden nobody wants anything to do with it because they say, well, wait a minute, I can't afford to pay for this stuff to keep happening. And I, so my thinking was, if we can go to the property owners and get them to agree that on the short term, while we come up with a long-term plan, that maybe we just simply put dumpsters and porta potties out there. You know, this past year, Winter Garden worked with us, and we have porta potties placed in various parts. I called the mayor and actually talked to him about that. He said that he would talk to the city of Winter Garden and get back to me. That never happened. But I'll tell you that to this day, for 13 months now, we've had porta potties in Winter Garden. Gee, what a novel idea that we're not letting human beings defecate behind buildings 
and what have you. Because part of what I've been telling people for the last number of years is this tsunami is coming. And here's the thing that's going to happen. When COVID hit, all of a sudden, all the public bathrooms were closed. If you still go around our town here in Okoe, Winter Garden, when, you'll find that most public bathrooms are still closed to the public. I don't know how legal that is. I don't know how that works. But because of COVID. So where did they go? Here's one thing I know for sure. God created us. And if you don't believe in a God, that's not my issue. But all of us are going to poop probably once a day. It's where are you going to poop? And what kind of dignity are you going to have when you poop? And what kind of health issue are you going to have when you just poop in the public? The mayor shared concern about the drug addicts. And I said, Mr. Mayor, you have two options. You can have drug addicts in the woods, or you can have them behind your, school, your schools. You can have them in the woods, or here's what's happening. In the first time in 20 years of me doing this in this community, and 11 is Matthew's Hope, we just turned 11, for the first time, we're seeing homeless people live behind buildings. Living behind buildings. And one was a 74-year-old woman who her only crime was her husband passed away, her income was cut in half, and she's homeless. Another was the gentleman, Ricky, she talked about, who had lived with her, his parents and then his sister until she passed. And he ended up on the streets. He doesn't know how to work with money, and he's mentally challenged. The third was a 67-year-old man that did everything we were all told to do when we were younger. Work hard, put your money back, and earn a pension. He worked hard. He put his money back. He earned a pension. And then he had three heart attacks. Started out a bunch of medical bills. Then they had to remove a lung. So at 67 years old, he has a pension. He can't afford to live here anymore. He lives behind a building right now here in Ocoee. Because that's where the homeless go. I've lived both. My, when I was homeless, I was mostly on the streets. I was, that's where I ended up. I learned how to snuggle up to a dumpster. I learned how to find food. If you find dignity in that any, in, in any way, I, I don't know what's wrong with you. And the fact to ignore it for this long, the problem is you can't ignore it away. And what I have seen over the years, and I said this to, to Mr. Johnson, I said, the police have not been very good in Ocoee when it comes to working with the homeless. We have had an agreement with the city of Winter Garden now for 11 years that when a property owner approaches not them, not they approach a property owner, property owner approaches them, that they will come to us. Now, I'll first ask the property owner, we're working with Matthew's Hope. Can you give them two weeks? This way we can get their belongings. What often happens is here in Ocoee, they get rid of them very quickly. And when it happens, a lot of times they lose their personal stuff. Now they don't have an ID, so now they can't get anything. They can't go anywhere. They can't cash checks if they get them. They cannot uh, get a room if they have some money. They cannot get a job. So they lose their Social Security cards. Part of what Matthew's Hope does is help people get birth certificates, Social Security cards, Social Security benefits, all that kind of stuff to keep them going. So the bottom line, to answer your question, I know there's probably more than some want to hear this evening. The bottom line is this. If we don't come up with some kind of plan in the very, very near future, you think you're run with homeless people now, you wait till you see what's about to happen. And then we gotta develop a plan. We have three, this is crazy, whoever agreed to this years ago, who knows who it was, we have three shelters in the state, in, in the, in the, town, in the uh, county of Orange County, all of them within walking distance of one another, and 11 miles from here. How are these homeless people supposed to get there? Number two, because first off, our link system out here is terrible. In case you aren't aware of that, it's terrible out here in West Orange County. But not only can they not get there, does everybody know that you pay to live in a shelter? You don't go to a shelter and just show up and get in. You pay to be there. And then you wonder why we have panhandlers. Well, because we created the exactly thing we say, we claim we don't want to have happen. They got to pay $10 a day, that's $70 a week, that's $280 a month, I could go on. All I was really asking here tonight is not for anybody's approval to put porta potties on personal property. And I will guarantee you, with all my very soul, some of the things that have said to put me out as that me as some kind of liar in all this is God is my witness. <laughs> God help you. Thank you. I mean, we're, the thing is, we've got to get, and it can't be just a Coe. It's got to be working Winter Garden, Windermere, Apopka, Oakland. And most people in those areas have officials that are very interested in coming to the table. But the truth of the matter is, is there's been a reputation for the lack of wanting to work with others. 
We gotta change that. If that's not true, then let's prove that it's not true. Otherwise, the reputation is such that that's not gonna happen. Well, let me ask you this, um, just, just a simple question. Um, I've heard, I've heard many comments tonight concerning this, and um, what I'm hearing is that the property owners have to agree to allow individuals to have camps on their property. And once they allow that, if they allow that, that this commission could possibly vote to have a dumpster and a porta potty on that property. That was my understanding. If, yes. If you if you if you can um, if you your organization can approach a property owner and get that understanding or agreement or approval to do so, then if that is the case, you would do that. I would make a motion before this commission that if those terms are met, that we would actually um, put a dumpster and a porta potty on that property. I think it's, there, there's some challenges to it, we know, because we have two things. The city has got at some point sit there and quit just finding people. There's areas they say they get complaints at that you can't even see from any public road that have been supposedly people have called to complain about the trash. You can't visibly see this. Someone has to go looking for it, and I agree the trash is there. The, there's also this question of liability. So we have two things there that are going to control that concern the property owner is they aren't concerned about liability until a city official tells them to be concerned about liability because then they feel like there may be an issue for them that's going to create more problems than, with, for them later on when they go to develop and what have you. And, and that's part of the challenge. So at this point, because we've had people working to get folks to think that way, it's going to be tough. But I think that if the city, as Mr. Mayor said to me and Shelley, my associate, he said that if three people would go along with it, he'd go along with it. I'm assuming since there's five of you, he's one of the three. So that means I need three of five to agree with that. All that agrees to is letting us to do it, and if we can get it done, that the city would then help provide, in which he also said, he said, I believe he said, we are under contract, so we would have to look and see what that contract looks like right. to be able to have additional sites. That would make sense. That would be what I would call taking it to the right way and be legal. And so I have no issue with that at all. We simply want to see if we can get the people to the table, have a seat at the table, whether it's Matthew's Hope or someone you trust more or you think is doing more in this community. I'm not here to, to say look at us. I'm simply saying for 11 years I have poured millions of dollars into your city to make a difference. We didn't have a single COVID case. We, we went through 60,000 masks. I can go on about why you want to be paying attention here because can you imagine these folks that get on public transportation sometimes just to get out of the elements and they aren't getting PPE? Can you imagine? It's kind of, I, tell, I compare it to this, Mr. Oliver. It's like doing cancer surgery and leaving just a little bit of cancer and hoping it goes well. That's not only stupid, it's ignorant. It's ignorant if you don't acknowledge it. It's stupid that once you know it, that you just sit there and ignore it. I'm not saying who's stupid, who's ignorant, but I am saying this, is that we gotta stop. And it's my, and I said this to Mr. Mayor to his face, and I will not say anything publicly that I will not say to his face. That's just who I am. I said to him the other day, I said, no, sir. He said he was there to represent the property owners. And I said, no, sir, you are there to represent your constituents. And by the federal United States Constitution, you do not have to own property to have rights in the United States of America in case you weren't aware of that. Well, I, your I, constituents. I did state, sir, that if we could meet those conditions uh, from the property owner's standpoint, I would be happy to make a motion before this commission that we would uh, uh, look into adding dumpsters and porta potties on those properties. But if you can actually come back with that information, that agreement with any, any uh, Okoy property owners that is willing to allow uh, um, to set up homeless camps, then I'll be more than happy to make that motion. Thank you, sir. One thing I would add to that in the process, because it is triage. This is not a long-term answer by, by any stretch of the imagination, but it's, it's trying to stop the bleeding right now before we figure out what the next step is. 
if we could lay off the property owners a little bit, Matthews Hope goes out twice a week mobily now besides our normal outreach. We go out to all these places. Right now we aren't visiting any camps because there are no camps. We're visiting places and they meet us there and we take care of them. We're now we're at 300% over last year. We're seeing hundreds upon hundreds of people every week. And here's what I would ask you is, if we can lay off the property owners a little bit while we come up with the triage on that as far, Matthew's Hope will go out twice a week and make sure that everybody is being compliant. And if there's an issue with a particular individual, then deal with the individual, not go out there and trespass an entire camp, because typically you'll find it's one or two people that create most of the problems in every area. In that case, is our police chief here? Uh, yeah, acting police chief, let her address the issue from, this, from the policing standpoint. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, one of the things I will say is, once again, he clarified at that time, I did say, if you get permission from the homeowners or the landowners to do this, then I have no problem going along with it. That's got to be signed over with a waiver from the, from the landowners. So that's what we're right back at it. You got to go to the landowners and get them to sign a waiver saying they'll let you put a dumpster or garbage cans, whatever you want to call them, on the property. Um, so I've got, you were on that call the other day. I don't want to get in too long. We already talked about this long enough. It's something we all got to address. I will make one quick statement. I called one of Garden Mayor John Reese. He called me. I talked to two of the other, one of the other commissioners and I talked to Mike Bohoffer. We are getting the group together to do some stuff, work on homelessness. So we're going to be dealing with it through the mayor of Winter Garden, myself, and there's another guy, I guess, out of Claremont. So I guess that's good because some of these people were from Claremont tonight, so we can discuss all of it. So I already talked to uh, John Rees, the mayor, and they're all in favor of doing that. So we're going to work towards that with ourselves. So what do you want to add? I will. The question See, I, was I've heard how some you not very nice things about our police department from the, uh, these people. So if we're going to do that, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, you you brought it up. Well, I'm not going well, to get like my, I, You already talked, Scott. Well, you brought it I, up. No, I'm, no, it was fair. I didn't bring up well, nothing about. Exactly all right, now, now if you start, you're not going to be in here. So let's just calm down. Calm down. Right. You made the comments about stuff while it goes to. No, let's just calm down. I want her to talk, and then we're going to go on with our meeting. I got. I apologize to you, Mr. Motes. I forgot you a while ago. You were supposed to be at another point in the meeting. So I, as soon as we finish with her, I'm going to go to you, okay? Okay, Chief. So the question was... Acting Chief, I'm sorry. The question was, how many people have we trespassed from a camp? No, the question was simply, uh, are we willing to work with Matthews Hope to provide time, if they're going to be trespassed, to provide time for those folks to uh, be able to leave uh, if you, if if the homeowners agree, would the police department uh, ag agree to give them the time that they need to get the, their items from those camps, uh, so they don't just it's just not thrown away or they're, they're not lost of their IDs and, and the things that they need to survive. So, so will the, we will we set policies that, that would would, uh, would work with, with, with not only Matthews Hope but the but the uh, the property owners as well. So in the most recent case, which involved a corporation that owns multiple properties in the city of Ocoee, on February 27th, we were, it was brought to the, our attention from that business owner. That business owner told us that he had some encampments on his property and he was concerned. Um, we did assess them and we found there were some encampments. We actually reached out to Matthews Hope and asked for assistance in relocating those people who were at those camps. To date, we have taken no further action on any of those properties. So it sounds like you are willing to work with them to uh, provide the services they need in order to either move the camp, if they have to move, give them the time they need to kick together their, their, their belongings to move to another location. We have asked for their assistance, yes. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Mr. Motes, I apologize. You were supposed to be during item 10, you were wanting to talk about, so. Yes, sir. It's more your Oh, uh, okay, Moyer. Dr. Moyer says. <laughs> My name is Dr. Jim Moyer. I have a doctorate of education in organizational leadership 2019. I'm recently uh, a permanently and totally disabled 
fat train, and I'm going to talk now on the subject of homelessness and addiction because I worked 23 years for the Salvation Army Adult Rehab Center. When I was in Broward County, I went to many, many homelessness uh, meetings with county officials in Broward County, as well as city officials in Fort Lauderdale, and many private organizations. So if we're moving forward on this subject and you want to volunteer to be a part of it, I'll gladly do so. My eldest son in New Mexico was homeless for three years. He refused to accept money from me. He refused to come live with me. And it wasn't because of addiction. He had no addiction issues whatsoever. It was simply low esteem, low self-esteem. So there, as was said, there's a myriad of reasons that a person may be homeless. It can be addiction. It can be low self-esteem. It can be a tragic event. Many other potential. It comes down to the individual, as was said several times. And we need to address the individual. And we need a short-term and long-term solution, as was said. And I'll gladly participate. Now on another matter, why I originally uh, asked to speak on subject 10, um, item number 10, is we live in exponential times. That's a fact. That means what took place in the past is totally irrelevant. Actually what takes place in the present right now when we're addressing the future is not relevant. Time is changing so quickly, and it's, it's driven by technology, and it's driven by globalization. So putting Commissioner Oliver, who teaches a IT at a middle school, and I'm sure has uh, many diverse children, uh, in his classroom is the ideal situation. And it was my intent to bring this up in the beginning because that's the way the agenda was written. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. And again, I'm willing to work with anybody, county, private. Thank you very much and God bless all of you. Thank you. Melissa Myers. Good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Myers. Um, I come to the commission as an HR professional for the past 20 years of my career, as well as a concerned homeowner and resident for the city of Akoi. Um, it was stated in a previous commission meeting that we do not have a mass exodus when it comes to the city's firefighters. Well, to date, uh, we are just entering the month of April. We now have 10 firefighters that have left the department this year. As an HR professional, I question internally what is being done as this is indeed a mass exodus. As a homeowner residence, a place where I raise my family, um, allows me to question uh, the safety of our communities and how serious that the city leadership is taking this issue. After doing some research, I learned the following. The starting annual rate for the firefighters had stayed at the same rate of $36,900 for the last 12 years. The annual salary rate is now at $40,000. That was changed in December. Now that's great, but it only affected the new hires that's coming in. Current firefighters did not receive a substantial increase with the new contract agreement. Along with that, they hadn't received a raise in the past three years. Now, although they recently received a three to nine percent raise, it still does not equal the amount of raises they would have received if it had been consistent over the years. So if these men and women would have received an average of a three percent raise for each year, they would have had at least a 12 percent increase, okay? 
Now the average cost for a new hire, that's to recruit and onboard a new um, employee, that's roughly $4,000, okay? That's not including the training, the new equipment, the uniforms that it costs to get a new firefighter ramped up, okay? So now it's costing the city thousands of dollars to replace these 10 firefighters, okay? Now, the national average, okay, there is, let's see, the national turnover average for firefighters is 25%, okay? We are now, as a city, at a 47% turnover rate with our firefighters, okay? Now, I have spoken personally to most of the firefighters that have left the department, and their story is all the same. It's the salary, okay? We depend on these men and women to provide safety for us. Our country thrives on taking care of those who take care of, take care of us. Those are our military, our police officers, our healthcare professionals, and right here in our city, there has been a disregard for our current firefighters. The first step has been taken, okay? But let's properly take care of our current firefighters so we won't have to pay thousands to replace them. It makes financial sense, as well as showing the taxpaying residents of Akoi that you care for our safety. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, city lawyer needs yeah, it. I just I just wanted to remind the commission that we're in negotiations with the uh, firefighter union and uh, probably not appropriate at this meeting to um, discuss salary or any uh, any matters concerning uh, the fire department. All right. Question, why not? I'm just, just, I'm just curious. Just because, explain why not. Yeah, why? because we, we, we shouldn't be negotiating um, out in the open, we have um, we have union we have represent representation um, on the city side, and we'll meet privately to discuss those contract negotiations, and then obviously vote in the public. Uh, but you'll have your chance to um, to speak with the representatives that have been directly negotiating. Um, so just just to keep with um, the integrity of the negotiation process. Um, it's best to, to do those um, with our representation um, in, in closed meetings that we're allowed to. Um, obviously, the vote, the approval is done out in the open, but that's that's the reason. All right. So we will have a uh, we will have an opportunity here in the near future to be able to weigh in what a absolutely we, what we think should be done, or at least what we can contribute as a city to uh, get this uh, resolved and, and get our guys. Back yeah, to work or, re, or proper re, uh, uh, the retention of our firefighters. Yeah, you'll approve the contract that that um, uh, that's come before you and presented to you. But we'll discuss, and you can give your input uh, to the city's representatives at, at those meetings. The last contract was what is it? Is it 16, 2015, 16? The one that we're operating on right now? No, the, the last contract commissioner brought us current to October of last year. October so last year. since. Um, October on, now we're working on the new contract for the next three years. Okay. Also, we just right. hired eight. We just hired eight new firefighters. All right. Let's get the, um, let's see. Where are we at here? At the end. Oh. Any more staff action, Rob? Yes, sir. Comments? We're done with that. Comments from commissioners. Commissioner um, Oliver. You sure you want me to start? Okay. All right. Time okay. goes. All right. Well, let's go. You do what you want. All right. All right. The first thing I have on my uh, my item here, my agenda, my agenda here is I want to talk about the hiring of our new police chief. I want to talk a little bit about um, what did that process look like. I uh, would like to hear from the city manager um, to talk about. What it looks like, and you know, and, and Rob, I'm not really asking you to do anything tonight because I don't want to put you on the spot because I know that uh, it takes time to put things together. But what I would like to do is, I would like to uh, maybe um, bring up a motion that we able, that we actually ask the city manager to uh, provide a report to the city commission as to what does this process look like? How are we going to put together this uh, committee of police chiefs to interview potential candidates for our next chief of police? Now, the reason that I bring this up is the fact that. Our police department is, uh, this is our public interest. 
as well as our public safety. And we all elect officials up here. We're, you're going to hear you're going to hear commissioners say that this is not our decision, and, and it's not our decision to make. They're going to they're going you're going to get a hands off approach from the city commission to state that um, we really have nothing to do with it. We're gonna, it's going to be a Pontius Pilate moment where we wash our hands of it and give it to the city manager. Well, as a city commissioner, as elected as an elected official in the city, sworn to to protect the citizens of Okoy. I think that the, the position of our chief of police is one of the most highest ranking uh, public safety officers that we have in our city. And I feel that there is an obligation, I have a fiduciary duty to the people that elected me to be able to chime in as to what this process looks like so that there is transparency when it comes to this whole process. So I will make the motion tonight before the commission. I'm making this motion. You don't have to second it. And you don't have to say anything about it, but I'm going to make, I'm going on record to make the motion that the city manager comes before this, this, this commission to give us a report as to how this, uh, this commission, this, this committee is going to look to hire our next chief of police, when is it going to happen, how it's going to happen, and what agencies are, that he's going to recruit to sit on this commission, and it, will there be any influence from any of our department heads in the city of Okoy. So I make that motion. Do we do? Does that need to be a motion, or can that be consensus? I don't know if that's. Yeah. E either way, I, I mean, I think if you're if you're looking strictly from the charter, um, there are certain positions that the city commission um, has input in. City manager is one of those. City attorney is the other. That may be the only two uh, positions that the yep. city commission um, has input in appointing. The rest of uh, employees of the city or uh, uh, it's up to the city city manager to determine and uh, largely determine what that process is um, having said that I've never heard um, city manager Frank um, say he won't meet with you or talk to you or get your input um, so you can certainly make a motion um, uh, by consensus that um, uh, he provides you with a, uh, with a report or, and, and I don't, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's entirely up to him, kind of the process and how he's going to do it. Um, but, I, but I would imagine that uh, just based on, and he can speak for himself, um, he's, he's probably going to be open and, and can, can fill you in and, and is happy to meet with you if you'd like to understand what that process is. Well, that's fine. I think the public has a, r a right to hear it to hear exactly what that process looked like. So not, not behind closed doors. I know I can meet with him and I know we have to meet with anyone, saying, but I think that I, the public has the, yeah. I'm sorry, hold on, let me finish. I think the public has the right to hear this process and how it's gonna go and when it's gonna go. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, in the interest of doing what the charter directs me to do, um, you know, I feel that I, I need to do this um, as an administrative act um, and at the same time I don't really have an issue with telling you how we're going to go about doing that I think I've had some discussions with each one of you and we're firming those um, the procedure up right now and I committed from the beginning to um, contract with a professional agency and it's going to be the Florida Police Chiefs Association we anticipate this will probably be done sometime within the next month to month and a half um, they're in the process right now of identifying up to seven panelists who are retired police chiefs uh, from the state of Florida. And knowing a couple of the internal candidates we have, we've told them to stay away from, you know, um, the direct area around us, Central Florida and South Florida. So we're going to have um, five to seven independent high-level police personnel come in to do an independent evaluation. Uh, maybe some type of assessment and um, 360 degree type thing, talking to some of the people who report to these individuals right now. So that's what we intend to do. We want it to be above board. We want it to have a fair um, competition. And um, that's about where we are right now. But um, we're putting together um, with the Police Chiefs Association a professional panel who will interview them and have some practical exercises that are um, 
fit for an executive, a police executive, and um, we're going to come up with a recommendation from that. Where are these uh, these five to seven individuals come from? They're from around the state. From all, of throughout, Florida. throughout the state of Florida. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that's what I've been told. And we were interested in doing this because we have internal candidates, um, very qualified internal candidates. And, you know, there's been interest from the community and there's been people who want to send um, recommendations for the different candidates. And we're going to have five to seven professionals come in who don't know these two individuals and are going to assess them and they're going to recommend one of them to me. We may have three, we may have four, all internal, but they're going to recommend the candidate that they think is the best fit for this will, will you Will you open it up for other individuals outside the two that, that, that you, you mentioned? Will you open it's gonna, it up to? It's gonna be internal. We know we have a couple of qualified okay. candidates, but um, we're probably gonna do that next week. We're gonna open it up to see if there's any other candidates internally who are interested in it. Okay. We felt with the candidates we had, we didn't need to go outside because we have a couple of qualified ones in, internal. So we're going to go ahead with that. Okay. And that's where we stand. All right. So that actually that satisfied my motion. So whether yeah. I mean, I don't have a problem discussing. Not, that, that, you, you, you know, Commissioner, you can call me at any for. time and talk about these things. Yeah. Um, I think the purpose of having the restriction in the charter is so it doesn't become an issue where you know you have some type of town meeting and there's 500 people that want one candidate and there's 500 that want another candidate we want them assessed on their ability their experience their education and um, we're thinking with a panel of five to seven retired chiefs they're going to pick the right person that's fair enough awesome um, the next item i have is um back in December, we agreed to have a conversation concerning race, inclusion, and diversity amongst uh, the elected officials and the department heads. Um, at the um, February 2nd meeting, we brought that back up after we had a conversation with Dr. Payne, Dr. Scott, Scott Payne, uh, of the Florida uh, League of Cities. And the consensus was that we would bring it back before the commission um, COVID was the concern. Um, things are starting to open up. Um, I would like to uh, have staff come back with some dates. We can contact Dr. Payne again so we can actually establish uh, a couple of dates that we can look at. Uh, we work with the, um, our executive assistant to come up with some dates to have this conversation with the uh, city commission. So I uh, just want to make sure that we're all still on the same page when it comes to this conversation that we agreed to have and um, coming up with the date now, since we have uh, the, the vaccine is, is coming out, things open up a little bit. So um, I know Commissioner Wilson uh, did have some concern about being in a closed room and I, I certainly get that. So now that we've uh, kind of moved beyond December, we're in uh, early April now, if we look down the road toward May, June, or July to have this conversation, um, I would ask the staff to come back with uh, some recommended dates after speaking with Dr. Uh, Dr. Payne about this, this conversation. Is that a, is that a consensus? I, I think last time we tried to do that and we brought some dates back and that's where we got a little pushback that we were trying we maybe being a little aggressive. That person to do it? I, I believe he did. Yes, no, I, I believe the commission did because he came in to speak that February, night. February second. That was the time we were originally looking for. Is he provided by Florida League of Cities to us? Is yeah, one of our I, I, he has a couple of different affiliations, but it was Florida League of Cities. Florida um, Cities. So we were originally talking late February and March, and that's when the issue came up. Perhaps we should push that out a little because there were still some COVID issues. Vaccines were just coming out at the time, so. Um, you know, if, if there's a consensus, um, I would just ask when. Are we talking May? Are we talking June? Um, well, can, can we get with Dr. Payne to find out what their schedule is like and then maybe bring it up? If back I remember correctly, Commissioner, when we were talking with him, he said, you know, if you're talking a month, a month and a half out, he's pretty <coughs> much available. It was, okay. it was within like two or three weeks that were the issue. But um, last time we spoke with him, he said if you were a month to a month and a half out, there's probably not going to be a problem. I think we had decided on a, a Thursday. Yes. Um, and so their availability should be um, fairly good. I just need to kind of center on maybe two weeks and if it's May, if it's June, um, you just tell me 
and I can work with Dr. Payne for that. I think we need to at least give folks, if whoever's coming, to vaccines are just being opened up to people who are all ages. That just started Monday. We need to make sure that we have given someone ample time, especially someone who may be 25, 30 years old who'll be coming, that they've had time to get the shots. And what in the paper Sunday, it said two weeks after the second shot is when you should be protected, I guess, the best we know. But it, a lot depends, I think, on when Dr. Payne is available. Right now, you're in legislative session, so I don't know what's going on with them in Florida League of Cities. So why don't we contact Dr. Payne, see if we can look for sometime in June that we might be able to do this and see what his schedule looks like. Bring it back, and then let's start scheduling. Um, let's not tarry on it too long. I think that gives ample time for folks who are still getting shots. So if that's a consensus, I can get with him and, and try to come up with a couple of dates for y'all in June. I'm okay with that. It's the rest of you guys. We're waiting on the rest of you guys to say something. I'm sorry? I'm okay with it. Well, well I just want to give people ample time to get, for them to be comfortable and to come into the setting. But um, we need to make sure we do it before budget session because we're going to start coming into budget session yeah. in July. That, won't, that will be right before us pretty soon. I'm okay with sometime with June. I don't, I don't think we need a consensus. Do we need no, a consensus on that? I think I think already, he's waiting on the consensus. Oh, I thought we already discussed this. I thought we already discussed it and approved it. Just a no, we're just talking about dates. dates. We're just talking about Possible the dates. dates. Oh, okay. That's all. Uh, yeah. No, the consensus was for the date because the last time we went, we pinned him down a couple of times and then I brought it back here and it was like okay. a couple of you weren't comfortable. So I just want dates that you're comfortable. You need to get the dates from him when he can do it and then let us pick. Yeah, yeah. Do you, is that I June? I mean, is it June? Yeah. June? Yeah. I don't June. know. Hopefully I'm going to be gone in June some, so let's, let's okay. get the dates and from him. Okay. Well, I, I can probably get you several dates in June. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. See come up with. Thumbs up from here. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, for what? Because the city does not have a mission, a vision, or core values in the city, in the city. we talked about this about a year ago, and I'm, I'm going to bring it back, I'm bring it back full circle now. Um, we talked about having a workshop to actually sit down with the commissioners to have to, to establish a, a mission and a vision for this city. I know our individual departments have a mission, vision uh, statement for each individual department, but the city as a whole does not have a mission. The city as a whole does not have a vision, nor do have we established any core values that, that supports that mission and that vision. So we want to, um, again, talk about dates again, uh, establish workshop. We talked about this, and uh, we need to look at scheduling some dates uh, sometime here within the next six months or so that we can actually, if we want to wait to after the budgeting workshop, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But I, I don't want for this issue to go away. I don't want to just talk about it, and then it just kind of floats off in, into uh, to space. So I, I want to make sure that this, that this conversation continues on. And, and with that, I want to get a consensus to see if we can come up with a date after our budgeting cycle to uh, hold this workshop to establish a mission, a vision, and core values uh, for, the, for the entire city. Again, it says people without a vision will perish. We were doomed to repeat the same things over and over and over again. So we need to know strategically where we're going, how we establish this vision, and strategically how we get there what is our drivers for these things? What are the core values that holds up our mission, that also holds up our vision? So um, I would like to come up with some dates sometime after um, uh, some looking for a consensus again, uh, that we can actually come up with some dates to uh, establish a, maybe a, we could do a one or two day workshop, open it to the public, and just start talking about how we set these, strate these strategic uh, uh, drivers, these strategic goals. Have my consent. I have no problem with it. I think. So the consensus would be if the staff would actually look at some dates and maybe have the executive assistant contact us individually to look at our schedules and come up with a date that we can do a workshop and we can put together a workshop uh, of how we start formalizing or lay the groundwork for uh, these uh, strategic uh, goals. And when, when will we do that? So we, we're done, we, we, we vote or not, we, we make our last vote in September, so we'll be sometime in October, maybe November, maybe one day before we hit the new year. Could, maybe, if I may interject something here, please. Sure. Um, 
Could you, do you mind? Okay, no, I should ask the mayor because he's in charge. Um, do you have other cities? I'd like to see before we set dates if you have what other cities have done. I would like to see those. Um, again, what other cities have for their missions. I mean, that might help us to make a, a decision regarding the direction we want to take. So, again, if you could provide those to the clerk where she could distribute them to us. I believe that's the procedure, correct? I think that's a very good it would help uh, us uh, question, the, the next as I direction. do have a few. Good, but I mean, so if you can I'll, I'll have provide those, that information. That would help. I think that would help me in understanding what direction you want to take, especially before we set a meetings up, to know what direction other cities have taken, so we can then understand. Yeah, I can probably get a for. couple, of, maybe uh, maybe a mayor and a few commissioners from different cities to talk about this particular strategic uh, plan that they set up, and uh, maybe bring it to our uh, city manager so we can kind of set up some framework and then maybe schedule some dates. Yeah, I, I can do that. But I'd like to see myself before we move forward what um, other cities have done. I think it, it guides us in the direction and how we feel it would be most appropriate for our city. Okay. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. One of the things we just have to uh, figure out also is um, what the audience is going to be for this. If it's going to be staff and commission, um, we have done this three times before in the city. Um, it may have been strategic planning. Strategic planning. Yes, we did. Um, yes, sometimes it worked out real well. Sometimes it didn't work out so well. I think the last time we actually um, we had it, and um, it was like a workshop town hall. And um, as I had suspected, there was public there, and which is good to an extent. But uh, the staff was not real open and, and frank on some of the things that we need to deal with. So I think we need, need to look at the format. Um, I don't particularly see the value in just doing it from a staff point of uh, view. So what we did the last couple of times, we actually did staff in the commission and we, I think the last time, we went over to, um, I think it was St. Paul's once, we went over, um, we went to the mall time. once, right, just to get out of City Hall. And um, so, Format, how we're going to do it, how long we want to spend on this. Those are some important questions I think we need to, to discuss also. Um, I think it works best if it were a meeting with uh, senior staff and the city commission so we can all get on the same page. Um, not necessarily a workshop where we have hundreds of people yeah. in there. I think well, long as we continue to have that conversation and keep that in the, in the foreground, I think mm -hmm. we'll be okay and we'll, we can definitely get it done. Yes. Uh, I think it's just something that is, uh, it is extremely important that we have that as a city, as a whole. Yeah, and I think the last times we had scheduled it and we were um, probably, uh, you know, we did eight hours or so with lunch and um, the one time where we did have the public come in, it more or less turned into more like a workshop meeting and that one we really didn't get too much out of. We got a couple of small goals. We didn't get an overriding uh, mission statement for the city or anything like that. Uh, there's not a lot of consensus by the end of the day, so. Um. Okay, um, is there, is, is uh, uh, Doug still in the back there? Doug Gang still in the back? Doug, could you, I left a folder up there uh, oh, yeah. under the, uh, right there's a little gray folder, some photos. Is it, <laughs> could you possibly pull those, those photos up, please? That's the, uh, could you put this another one? It has the, the, it's a larger pile there. I think it should have been on top, the one on top. Yeah. That, that, that trash pile you see there, just some palm leaves uh, that I, I tracked for two weeks in our trash. This is something that, that comes before me, or I get text messages, emails every week, sometimes two weeks, sometimes twice a week. This is what's happening with our trash pickup. This was sat, on, this was sat there on a, I think on a Tuesday. The trash pickup was on a Thursday. And um, the, 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 the goal is to actually have this picked up on Thursday. But uh, we, we talked about this being, should be, what, is it th three cubic feet? Four. Cu four, four, four cubic feet, right? The size of a, of, a, of a regular pickup truck. So what I did was, my neighbor, we measured that. Cubic yards. Cubic yards, I'm sorry. We measured that, and then we measured this pickup truck. It was perfect fit. And when they, 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 they left one week, the first week they just left it. They rolled by and just forgot about it. They, they rolled by and they left it. 
The second week that they came by to pick it up, show me the next photo. Well, it looks like you have an order here. Here's a, I guess that's week one. No, go back. Next one. The first one you put up. That's what they left from the pile that you saw the first time. They left that. So they only pick, half, pick up half of it. The problem I'm having is this. You only have one chance to make a first impression. I'm not impressed. We've been doing this for, what, four or five months now? I, and I understand there's growing, gonna be growing pains, I get this, but we have a lot of, it's too many growing pains. And I, don't, I can't speak for the other commissions. I can only speak for the phone call that I fielded. I can only speak for the text messages that I, I replied to uh, and the emails I've gotten about our trash pickup. So what I would like to know is if this continues on, what is our course of action? How do we, um, is there a escape clause in our contract? If there is a escape clause, what does that look like? What does the cost look like if we had to, to back out of this? I mean, again, um, there's just a lot of citizens that, that I know of that's just not happy with what, we, what we're getting from our trash pickup. Um, we talk about the learning curves and, and, and I, I get that, but again, it's happening far too often and I, wanted, I want to be more proactive about this. Let's look toward the future and say, okay, if we continue to have these problems, what is our course of action? What, do, what, what will we do? Do we actually come back with some recommendations as to here are some options as to what we do if we need to get out of this contract and go back to the uh, city-owned trash disposal? Um, so what do we do? How do we approach this? And it, and it looks like it could be costly. Well, we we, 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 we could certainly come equipment. up with options. We're used to doing that because we seem to contract out about every eight years and then uh, come up with mm -hmm. something else after that. Um, we can come up with options. I, I think the escape clause, as we called it, is probably six months. Um, it would take at least that long for us to do it ourselves. I did have one discussion with the mayor today, and there's, there's some unique things we could look at also. Um, we could ask them to change their contract to pick up more stuff, mm -hmm. as you will, um, to, for them to lease or uh, purchase a, a claw truck that could do some of the things. This is something we would have picked up with a claw truck. I, I understand they don't have a claw truck that can do this type of work. So that's probably some of the, the problem. I mean, it's going to add to the cost, though. So current yearly contract costs that we have right now, if we want to start picking up some of these things, this to me looked like something they could pick up. And I know you shared this with me, Commissioner Oliver. This was one of the few that I saw and I absolutely agreed and I did call them and I don't know if they ever end up picking this up. A lot of the times the complaints we're getting are for um, piles that are bigger than four um, cubic yards. The question is, so I mean, you know, if we don't pick that up and they put two out, they're just going to put two out the next week. So I don't know that it benefits them by not picking it up. And then sometimes the pile's out there for twice as long. So, I mean, and there's a lot of different things we can look at. Um, I would like to see some okay. of those, those recommendations, um, those options. I would like to see them come before the commission. Now, I can't tell you uh, where we What to, we look like if we decide to, to, yeah. to start looking at other options besides what we got. Well, the one option, if we started doing it ourselves again, would be very expensive because we would have to buy all new equipment at this point. And I think we were at, uh, looking at $25 before, and I, I think you'd be over just roughly, it'd be at least a $5 increase over that. I think one of the big issues seems to be the, the waste, the uh, yard waste is one of the biggest it's issues. All that of the having. issues seem to be um, yard waste, so yeah. So what if we were to purchase our own claw truck and okay, operate well, it ourselves? I mean, would that be an option? Well, there's two ways to do that. I mean, if we wanted to remove yard waste from their contract and have them decrease it, and we were just going to do yard waste ourselves, or we could tell them, give us a price where, you know, you guys need to go out and buy a claw truck and you need to pick up these questionable piles. And well, how much would that add? Can I make a comment on that? I brought that up already about buying a claw truck, but after what you said, one of the things about the, us buying a claw truck, I think we need to address it to them to do it. Right. But the problem is, then you got to hire another employee, maybe two. Well, yeah, it would so be more this than way one. You, you're going to get into hiring more employees with the, all the benefits and, and the insurance. But I think if right. we went to them and said, "Hey, you need to get another truck," the trash they don't and, have a problem with. Yeah. It's this, it's this. I think a lot of it's got to do with the driver. Yeah, it's all bulk waste and yard waste where we get all the complaints from. 
I'll also, uh, in addition to that, I, I, I think that that's, that's a good way to start a conversation as to how we resolve these kind of issues, um, having those conversations with them. I, I, I certainly agree with, with that, uh, that plan of action, at least, at least having that conversation that you guys need to lease out a truck and see if we can resolve this I mean, issue. We, we can look at the prices. I mean, the, the, the cost increase for them to do something like that may put us right back where we could have kept it in-house for the same price, though. But yeah, well. we, we well, don't well, have that. Me, I don't think we have question. that option anymore, though. We sold our equipment. Yes. What do we make on it? I don't. It's I don't, it I out. Tell how, much money, how much money did we make on the equipment that we sold? Some of the equipment we sold to this contractor, they were interested in the trucks that were two, three, four years old. They weren't interested in the older equipment. Some of the older equipment went to the auction. So, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't know. I would be curious to know how much we, we put, we, we, we actually brought in house as a result of either uh, leasing or, 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 or selling the, uh, the old equipment or sending the old equipment to the auction. I would like to see what that was, what the, what's the offset of, of that particular uh, dollar amount uh, versus um, purchasing a new claw or whatever we had to do to uh, get these guys going. Cause Again, if we brought them on on the, on the on the contract, again, we had to obviously pay them a set amount, which we were told that we would save some tax dollars uh, going this route, and and then we also should have made some money on the equipment that we sold. So I would like to know what that dollar amount is, what happened to that dollar amount, and why can't we reinvest that dollar that, amount in something else? That dollar amount went right into the Solid Waste Fund Commissioner. As you know, we can we contain all those costs and revenues into the Solid Waste Fund. We were about a six hundred thousand dollars in the red in the solid waste fund because we hadn't raised the price in quite so. At least the cost of at least two trucks went to that six hundred thousand dollars in the red that we were. And now I think that was one of the reasons when we looked at all the you know the the, the numbers, the red and the black. It was probably one of the reasons that it was contracted out. Um, but we were running a deficit in there for a couple of years, and that's why we brought it back for a rate increase. And uh, well, still would like to uh, um, see what we, we what, what what the conversation is going to be about this trash pickup and some of the options that we have uh, as a city to be able to uh, ratify this the issue that we, we continue to have week in and week out. So we will no longer have these conversations as we move forward. So let's see what let's see what what, what we can bring to the table. If sure, that's I'm a getting, consensus, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it does take calls. a lot of staff time and effort to do this. And, yeah, we're, we're and we did this last year, and I think we did it about a year before then. And uh, it's, it, it, you know, to do these cost estimates and to, to figure all this stuff out, I mean, if this is something we're really looking seriously at, I mean, we need to go ahead and do it. But um, it takes a lot of staff time and effort to put these options together and get the costs right. I mean, that's the biggest part is we don't want to tell you we can do this for $24 a month and then be in the red the following year. So we spend a lot of time on those projections and, and Take your time. how much revenue we that's going to cost. We need cost. this information. I think first thing you've got to do is figure out what, if we can get out of that contract, yeah, see we what, what it would take. If not, offer them the deal about adding another truck. <laughs> this is the third it, time we've privatized, if I'm correct. Probably sat here during all three, not all three times that I sat up here, but I sat out there during one of the privatizing. And I yeah. knew it was a wrong issue. And, that and I understand. I mean, unfortunately, this time we were $600,000 in the red. And, you know, I, I understand it was attractive to contract it out. Uh -huh. We know from the last times we contracted out, this is always the issue because we were very generous on um, bulk pickup before. Yeah. So we know bulk is always going to be the issue. So maybe a couple of ounces of uh, correction instead of going all out. Maybe we should look just uh, maybe have some discussions with them, see what they could offer us with a claw truck um, and give them examples like this. We don't, we don't want these things coming in. With a claw truck, they would have driven by, even if they said that was larger than four cubic, they would have just picked it up because it's one scoop of the claw truck. And you know, you know, we wouldn't I'm, be talking about this particular issue today. I'm not getting the complaints on the recycling. I'm not getting the complaints on right. the general household garbage. We, and I, you know, I do want to work with the contractor. I mean, I'm sorry, I did not want to do this and it passed, but, um, we need to see how they will work with us. I think if we have to go up in price, I don't think our residents as, as a whole, from what I'm seeing, are going to complain 
that greatly because they saw what services yeah. they had before. You know, I got calls this weekend that they weren't going to pick up trash cans anymore. Your yard waste in a trash can, they're only going to pick up bags. So, you know, I mean, I've, and I've saw that, I've heard of that also from other folks. Right. So again, we've got a lot of misinformation out there or yeah. these drivers are telling <coughs> the folks they're not going to pick up cans and um, that's wrong too. Which is something there's we can nothing clarify. in our ordinance that says that you can't put your stuff in a plastic can. So why don't we try this? And my suggestion would be, I, I understand these types of borderline questionable loads, somebody has six yards instead of four, give us a price, get your claw chalk, tell us how much it is to take care of that. The stuff that's obviously 12 yards and the person has a yard waste business or they're doing construction, those they can pay extra for, we're not gonna pick up. I think I understand what you all want. If we can convey that to the, uh, the contractor and say, how much would that cost? That might be where we should start. And yeah. say, this is raise the rates, I don't know. It might be a dollar, it might be $2, I don't know. But um, before changing the entire way we do this, why don't we see if that, we could even try that for six months and see if that rectifies well, some of the problem. You got budget time coming up, so we've got to get it figured out, cause, and everybody yeah. says they don't mind it going up. Yeah, you know, we might want to be more drastic with our recommendations if we were having issues with the recycling and the trash pickup, but we don't seem to have them there. It's all bulk. Yeah. So why don't we see if we can just deal with the bulk issue it's a, another dollar or so um, with budget coming up. You might want to look at that. And, uh, um, the last item uh, was really quickly. Uh, have we uh, resolved the issue with Will on the Lakes and their, their gate being hit by the garbage trucks? Have that been, have they, they decided to take care of that and get that, that issue resolved? Yes, Commissioner. I know they're working with them on it. They've been playing a little bit of phone tag and also, I guess, they just have some maintenance issues with the gate that it automatically closes on their trucks before they can even get by. Gotcha. So they're working through that. So they're issue. working through, okay, perfect. That's all I need to know. And I would like to implore if everybody would encourage the citizens, if they have service issues, to contact Public Works directly. We can contact Waste Connections immediately. And generally, if we run into issues like this, we can get them taken care of that day as okay. long as they have trucks running around. So the earlier they get to us, and then we also have a record of it. Um, I did address an uh, email with them uh, yesterday concerning their, um, the attitude of their drivers that they need to keep, make sure it's at, you know, up there because we can defend the um, ordinance all day long, but if their attitudes yeah. aren't right, we can't do it. You know, that's not tolerable. Mm -hmm. okay. So we are working with the contractor to make sure this stuff doesn't happen. But the more we know in public works, we can handle it immediately. Okay, thank you. Um, what are we doing about the left turn signals on the corner of Clark Road and Claire Corner Coy Road? What are we doing about that? Uh, we need it bad. We need some left turn signals that will uh, alleviate some of the many traffic accidents that we've been having on a weekly basis. Not aware that anyone was looking for left turn signals. I been up there checking out the signals this week because one of our, our um, city engineer went, came, came through there Friday after there, I guess there was a bad accident and we were looking at the sequences and all and it's it was more of people I guess on Claire Conicoe not paying attention to where they do have left turn signals there's some permissive signals some restrictive um, and they I just appears people aren't paying attention. The north and south off of Clark, there seems to be good flow there. We put some signs up to make sure people realize you have to yield to the left turn on the green. Um, at this point, no one's brought up talking we need, about We need left, left turn, turn signals lines. there because, again, the, the accidents are happening as the north and, the north and south side. So if I'm actually on Clark and Claricona Core heading north and, and the car is going south, and what's happening is they're not used to that car going, going, going straight, so they're turning right in front of it. And we have accidents every single week because there's no turn signal there. If there was a turn signal there, the traffic heading north would yield to the traffic going straight across, or the, or the turn signal would, go, would actually allow them to go and turn before that car heading south would, would, content, would commence uh, heading south on Clark Road. We, we, need some, we need to look at getting some uh, left turns, a left turn signal at least uh, uh, facing 
northbound on Clark Road and Claricorn are going. Uh, can, can we contact the county or somebody and say, what do we do need to do about Because once that road opens up, we're going to need, think about, how, think about the width of that road, we're still going to need those, those uh, left turn signals as we open up that, that portion of Clark Road. Well, and as you know, Commissioner, you've already approved to proceed with um, the rent completing the intersection. That was where you entered in the contract with Lennar. When the final configuration is constructed, there will be left turn lanes with directional um, um, restrictive left turns. At this point, it might be something where we do a the southbound goes while you know has the right of way, and then we um, make a green for the northbound. So, because right now I don't think we can put a there's not room to put a left turn lane. There's no left turn lane southbound. Yeah, so you'd have to do one so part of the intersection and you're going to well, screw up traffic. Well, heading northbound, you, can, you, you have that, there. you turn right, but you can keep straight. But you can also put a left turn signal to, to make that left turn before the, before the, uh, the motorist going straight heading south, southbound. We, that, the same place we have that sign, it would that, that, little, that little green sign there that says yield to left turn. Yes. Um, we need to have a, that needs to be a left turn signal right there. We'll look at that, Commissioner. Um, I, we can look at the traffic movements. I agree. There's a lot of accidents up there. I think it's mostly driver error and people not paying attention. But we can look to see if we can put a restrictive uh, turn signal there or just um, adjust the movements to where either northbound goes and southbound goes. But that may also cause delays on one of the, one of the legs. It may cause delays, but I would see uh, the, the most of the traffic flowing heading north is where you have the most congestion. So they should at least have a left turn signal that will allow them to clear that traffic out before you have those two or three cars heading southbound can go. So I don't think there'll be too much of a, uh, a restraint heading southbound when you're letting those cars go. But again, that, that, that intersection, the traffic accidents have increased exponentially as a result of opening up Clark Road because we're not used to that traffic pattern we got to have a left turn signal there to allow some of those cars to go. I'll get with Orange County and we can see what we can do. I okay. mean, there is a learning curve with every new traffic signal. Ingram, when that signal finally goes in, there will be, there, there will be some learning curve there too. But gotcha. we'll see what we can do on this one. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Um, the, uh, I did get word that the tree on Ingram Road that is hanging over Ingram Road that's about to fall. I think it's probably as a result of uh, maybe our last hurricane. And it looks like if you ever, ever travel Ingram Road, there's a hanging tree, and it is, it is a massive tree, and it looks like it could fall any minute now. And um, I got word from the staff that in the next few weeks, that tree will be removed. So uh, for those that are listening uh, that travel uh, Ingram Road, that tree should be removed in the next few weeks. So let your heart not be troubled. Uh, the widening of Clark Road, I see a sign, I think we started March 1st, so I see a sign that said that construction will be starting on the right of way, um, and it's my understanding that uh, that construction will not restrict the driving patterns along the road right now. That, Steve, that's something that you know about, is that right? Uh, because all the construction will be on the right of way, is that correct? I'm not familiar with the construction of Clark Road starting that soon. Um, I know they're going to be doing some work for the new development of crop, like south of Hackney Prairie along Clark, doing some work there. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. But I remember the discussion. The discussion was for, except for at certain points, they may have to stop the traffic for a, a backhoe to go back and forth or something like that. But it's all supposed to be out of the, the current uh, traffic lanes. For the yeah, future, th yeah yes. there is an electronic sign now on Clark Road stating that there is construction coming soon. That's for the that, that development it, that's under construction. Um, and not the widening, because we did sign the contract. The this is the widening hasn't been designed That's yet. too soon for the widening. They're still working on the plans for well, that. Well, I was told so. by our city planner that uh, starting March 1st, that that process starts uh, from that point in 18 months, we'll be done. That may be, yeah, but I, from the time that uh, we had given them the notice to proceed, I know they can't have plans and signs out there already because they didn't have a set of plans yet. So. Well, I'd like to stay on top of that to find out when this is going to actually start. Uh, I'll let it's, we'll it's, it's already set up. We, we've already voted. We, we, we're ready to move. 
Yeah, they've got a contract. They're they're yeah, doing. Yeah, we, yeah. We, 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 we want to it's, see this. It's happen. in their hands, so it's quicker than <laughs> commissioner. It's quicker than we could do it at this yeah, point. Um, so, and they're moving forward. How about the sidewalks um, along uh, Ingham Road? There uh, should be underway sometime before the end you know, of the Steve? year. We Sidewalks a, and lights, right? We have a meeting next um, Thursday with Duke. Uh, they're supposed to present their new lighting program for us so I can bring it to the commission. We don't want to put in the sidewalks till the lighting's installed because that we don't want the yeah, tear power the trucks. Up. Yeah. Yeah. But we're ready to move with both. So okay. hopefully we'll see something in you know by next month before the commission. Okay. Uh, also um, the um, neighborhoods, communities of uh, the reserve and forest trails. Uh, I was told that uh, your sidewalk repairs should be coming in the in the coming weeks as well. So I was told that that was going to happen. So if you live in forest trails, live in reserves, and I've sent those photos in on some of the sidewalks. So some of the ones that are in bad repair should start. They're just going to start working on those sidewalks as well. And uh, finally, um, is Doug still back there? On, the, on that computer right there, there is an icon on the, on, the, on the center of that computer there. Can you click on that to bring it up on the screen up here for me, please? An icon? On the computer itself, on, on the desktop of the computer, there is an icon on the center there. It is a, it is a flyer. Right there, that's, that one right there. There you go. Thank you. All right, in the interest of, um, of serving our public uh, as it pertains to our COVID-19 vaccinations, uh, I will be hosting um, a vaccination locations on, actually tomorrow, starting tomorrow, April 7th. Uh, April 9th is Friday, and also uh, April 10th, that's Saturday. Uh, April 7th will actually be at a, a location right, right outside of Okoy at a church, and then we have the Recreation Center, Orange County Recreation Center on the 10th. And if you want more information about those vaccinations, it's actually they're, they're going to be Pfizer shots. So if you're actually looking for your first dose or your second dose, you're more than welcome to uh, attend any one of those events there. I think there is a total of about 250 doses per location per day. And uh, you're welcome to, to get those shots. The, the age restrictions, I think, now is 18 and up. And you're welcome to get, go get those shots. You can go to uh, the city's website. There's a link on the city's website concerning uh, this, this the, you see the flyer there, concerning the, uh, the event. There you can also go to the city's Facebook page, and we also have information there. You have links there. You can actually uh, go, go in uh, and get more information about how to uh, schedule an appointment to receive your vaccinations. Um, and you can also go directly to www.oneokoi.org. They also have a, uh, a link there to uh, take you to the uh, scheduling a portal to schedule your shots as well. Uh, that information is readily and available for you. And uh, I'm, I'm done. And finally, uh, I will leave you with this. Um, my final thoughts. God does not make leaders. He makes servants that become leaders. Thank you. I yield back to the mayor. Mr. First. I'd like to uh, say job well done to the police department for establishing their guardian program. For those of you that don't know what the guardian program is, it's an educational program about autism, being that this is autism month, it's appropriate. And uh, it teaches the officers how to deal with people with special needs, particularly autism. If you want to find out more information about that, go to the city website, www.ocoe.org, and it should be up front on the page. If not, you can find it under the, the police department uh, section. Uh, kudos to the fire department uh, for their 12th annual golf tournament that they hosted for Base Camp Children's Cancer Foundation. They raised over $20,000. They continue to do a, a great job every year for base camp, and uh, I'm glad to see that it's continuing. Um, also, got this uh, memo we all did from uh, Mr. Shadricks about the Surface Transportation Authorization Bill, and it tells what that's all about and the projects that uh, we as a city submitted. 
and I'm really pleased to see that. Uh, they're logical and uh, hopefully they're good candidates for consideration. So if you know and Congresswoman Demings, please feel free to <laughs> give her a call and <laughs> yes. tell her to look favorably upon her. Exactly. Yes. And just as a side note to all that, um, in reference to the Metro Plan Orlando, in their TIP report or, or Transportation Improvement Program, we don't have anything listed down there for OCOE, with the exception of uh, Silver Star Road. The realignment. The realignment. And that is, keeps getting pushed out further and further because it isn't funded. And it's going to happen somewhere between 2026 and 2045. So don't hold your I, breath. I got it on my tracker. Yeah, that, that's all I have. Yes, I'll make this brief. First of all, um, Commissioner Firstner, remember when you had brought this up earlier about the workshops, having a workshop once a month so that we could um, yes. further the discussion at the workshop regarding questions we may have regarding things on the agenda and things going on. I wonder if that's something that we as a commission want to re-initiate once a month, which I know you do. <laughs> no, because you're just going to do just what we're doing here. Okay, I'm trying to... Um, <laughs> Well, I think I left you can, it where... You can, you can do it if you want to. I think I left it, uh, Commissioner Wilson, where we wouldn't schedule it as a regular reoccurring thing. But if we had the need to have a workshop where the five of us wanted to sit down and discuss an issue, that we can always do that. Okay. No, I just was thinking because it wasn't scheduled, and I'm trying to, um, should I say, make the meetings move a little faster no. at times because... Um, there's a lot going on. I realize we all can speak, and that's important to let our constituents know, but I just thought a workshop might um, eliminate some of the discussion by being able to talk to the um, different department heads. Um, the other issue we're having, I'm having it, I'm sure every district is having it. We have a speeding issue out there. Um, I've got, we've got Silver Star, I, in, my, in District 2, Silver Star, Orlando Avenue, White Road. Um, folks going in a 30 mile an hour zone. I had one pass me going 60 because we have a sign out there. You know, they're going 50. We have children walking, we have adults walking, we have folks out there, and this is really ridiculous that you have to get somewhere so fast that you're gonna go 60 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. Um, we don't want our children hurt, we don't want our adults hurt. We're not allowing people to cross at crosswalks, just speed right by them. When a person comes to a crosswalk, and you may correct me on this, Rob, but once they put their foot out, they're, we're supposed to stop, correct? Correct. <laughs> and that's not happening. So again, folks, you need to be more understanding, patient, and realize that could be your child out there walking to school with someone whizzing by at 60 and 70 miles an hour on a 30 mile an hour street. That's unacceptable. Silver Star Road, I believe, is either 40 or 45. I have a train going behind me with all the cars following me down all these streets because I'm trying to stay within the speed limit. And as soon as I turn off, they just buzz right by. Well, I'm afraid one of them's going to be hitting me in the back one day because they get so close. So please, try your hardest to remember that. Um, Ocoee Hills Road, another one. I mean, we've got some areas in there. When you get on that straightaway, you think you have the right to just fly. Please remember, there, this is not what, we, what I want to see. We don't want anyone hurt. Um, I believe... The trash issue, trash, issue, trash issue was one other item that was on kind of one of my hot spots, hot points. But um, I think we've talked that as far as we can. There's one more thing I just want to say. Mayor, you brought something up tonight, and I'll be very brief on this. But um, I commend you when you said two of you were on a phone call together, you got off of it. I think our residents need to understand what the Sunshine Law is. And we do not meet and discuss anything that may come before the commission. We can talk the weather, we can talk anything like that with each other, but when it comes to other things, we should not be. And we should, I, don't, I really appreciate if you would understand not to put us in those positions. If you wanna to talk to one of us, talk to one of us privately. Don't bring us together, don't have a conversation where other ones can hear. It's just not appropriate. We, that's why the Sunshine Law is in effect, and we, I think as commissioners and mayor, adhere to that. That also affects a lot of our boards. Um, there's different boards that we have that they're not supposed to talk to each other outside of a noticed meeting. So um, I try very hard, and I say I try very hard, and I hope I don't make mistakes. 
but um, we try very hard to adhere to that. And so we, I ask your support on that. Please talk to us privately. Don't send us emails. Or I ask the commission. People send us emails as all of us, but we should not respond all. We should only respond to the person itself. And I know we can make mistakes, but we don't need to let other people know what we're discussing with that resident or that individual. So I ask you, please, be aware. We try to be aware also of this, and we try very hard not to make mistakes. So thank you. I do have a little soapbox I get on regarding Sunshine Law. So thank you. Mr. Branson. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, well said. Uh, I think that's uh, very appropriate to let the community know uh, what our responsibilities are and, our, and what should be our limitations when it comes to the Sunshine Law. Now, uh, and I'm going to talk about also, I, I mentioned it earlier, but what I'm putting together is a West Side uh, community safety meeting that speaks to just what we've been talking about, and that is safety on the West Side of Orange County. Uh, traffic safety, uh, pedestrian safety. Uh, we have a lot of uh, child's Child safety and elder safety is big when they, when they become pedestrians because either children don't look, know to look, they don't look, or elders can't get out of the way. So we got to make sure that we, we uh, put some additional controls in place. Brother, there is a light. I believe Commissioner uh, Wilson has uh, had a light installed at a, on a road in her district recently uh, that I plan on doing the same thing in, in many other areas where it flashes when you go too fast, and it's going to be a permanent light. And, it, and normally when, when you have those flashing lights, it prompts you and, it, and it, it urges you to slow down. So hopefully that will be something that uh, we're going to do. In this meeting that I'm putting together, uh, the school board, the local law enforcement, state law enforcement, uh, local municipalities, uh, local stakeholders, uh, community stakeholders, as well as Visit Orlando. And I want to also, uh, once again, uh, invite Matthews Hope uh, to this meeting and we're going to talk about safety and one of those things that we have to talk about or areas we have to talk about in safety is our homeless population so that's something that we need to not just come together to talk about but we're actually coming together to apply some solutions anybody can talk about what the issues are but what are the solutions and so I'm trying to do that sooner rather than later because as we mentioned earlier we're going to have budget workshops uh, beginning and if we have some funding that needs to happen, we need to get that funding uh, on our list of things to do now so we can decide to fund it. Uh, traffic enforcement, I'm, I'm gonna kinda skip to that real quick. Right now, I've, I've spoken with Orange County, I've spoken with uh, the Coe Police Department, I've spoken with Orlando Police Department, I've also spoken with Winter Garden and they are they're increasing traffic enforcement when it comes to speeders and people who are doing these uh, California stops on these red lights and these stop signs. So be mindful. Uh, if you're gonna get a ticket, uh, it's because maybe it was your first time doing it, but you, if you get caught, you're gonna get the ticket. And we're gonna make sure that at, even though traffic enforcement really is a band-aid to this problem, we have to change the mindsets of these drivers. And so I know we have some young drivers, 16, 17 years old, 6.30 in the morning trying to head to high school in the hours of darkness. That's a, that's a problem. So we have to get everyone on board quickly. Again, I'm, I'm meeting with Visit Orlando, uh, see if they can shine a spotlight over here on the west side in the Coe, see how they can help us do whatever it is that we want to do. I think that's going to be a good uh, plus for us. Uh, they're excited about meeting with us uh, because they they've not done so before, uh, as well as uh, a couple of other uh, chambers are pointing them in our direction. I've got my vaccine, got both of them, uh, and I'm still here. So I encourage everyone to go out there and get your vaccine. Uh, we cannot get our arms wrapped around this, this uh, problem. It used to be an issue, now it's a problem called COVID-19 with all its variants, unless we uh, social distance, wear our mask, and now get the vaccines. Uh, Orange County, uh, if you can't make it to one of Commissioner Oliver's uh, rollout events, Orange County has a, an event that they're expanding to all adults, 18 and over, at Valencia, uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., seven days a week. Now, the, if you're getting the first dose, you should arrive early because the first dose, there's limited numbers of first dose doses available to you. So if you're getting your first dose, get out there early. If you're getting your second dose, come on out. Uh, and also, they, there are some uh, sites that roll around the county 
that roll around the county weekly on an as-needed basis. So if you're looking uh, uh, or you haven't had a, a vaccine satellite in your uh, community, reach out to Orange County or give me a call. Send me an email at lbrinson, B-R-I-N-S-O-N, at akoi.org, and I'll try to get that, that uh, satellite site coming to your area. Uh, again, some, some of the things that we have to do is make sure that we partner with our local uh, plank holders and our share, shareholders because that's going to help us drive these problems that, that are coming up and uh, down. Some of the things that we're going to face is going to be over the horizon. We're not going to be able to see them until they get right in front of us, but we don't want that to be too late because now we're going to crisis management mode and we don't want to do that. So that's important. Once again, on traffic, if I, if I haven't said it 10 times, I've not said it at all. Traffic, you must be patient. We do not want Commissioner Wilson to be the Pied Piper of these vehicles driving behind her. Be patient. Also, distracted drivers and distracted driving is just as dangerous as drunk driving. It's just, it's just as dangerous as buzz driving because it's all impaired driving. If you have your device in your hand and you're driving your vehicle and your vehicle is moving, you are a distracted driver. And if you don't believe that anyone can get hurt, just give a call up to the sheriff up there in uh, Volusia County and he will tell you that if you're, <laughs> if you're distracted, you can run someone over because it happened to him. Uh, and also uh, for our, our residents, uh, Long Worst Road. I'm going to be working on something over there as well. I know that there's Worst Road can also be a racetrack. So it is not a quarter mile strip for those who drive up and down Worst Road. It is not a quarter mile strip where you can see how fast your vehicle can go, vehicle can go in a quarter mile. And with that, I am finished. All right. Hey, Steve, would you please get a sign on the on Fluellen by the Little League field? You need two of them probably. That's that's a speed zone, and it's there's kids playing there, and it's amazing. They come around that stop sign from Ruiz, and they get see as fast as they can get. But there used to be signs there, and and used to be we had the police would walk around during little league games and stop by there. There's supposed to be a quadrant that our police officers go through. They work in in areas. That area there's what not one police car come by there. So they're supposed to be going in areas where there's each platoon or whatever you want to call them are in that area. They're not coming by there. And the other thing is, if we're speeding, why ain't they riding tickets? So, I mean, where are they at? I would ask the police, please, you know, come up and sit at the restaurant on Carlos's one day and watch them. And write, write them a ticket. But please put signs up at that Little League field where those kids are at. And, if you can put that blinking light just where it says slow or something, we need that. But they need signs there. And like I said, the police used to have a deal where they would come there and get out and walk around all the fields and say hello, let them see them, and then leave. Now they don't do it anymore. So I don't know. Okay. So uh, the other thing is, and on the sunshine thing, I don't know who. I can, I can tell you that the sheet right here says who was invited. And that's the only reason I go back. And when I found out not who told you to get over there, who, who you asked you to come, I don't know. But they sent this thing to me and I told them, I can only be there if it's me. So they sent this to me and it's got all the name uh, Simon's on there. And it's, um, that's where I went by until I found out there was other people talking. And I said, I got to get off. So um, the, other, the other thing is the trash thing. I think we would go at first, go towards seeing if we can get them to get another claw truck and what we do that way because it saves us from having to get a, an employee. And uh, we have a dead tree on um, Blueford Avenue there, Rob. One of those big, beautiful palm trees are dead in the doornail. It's right down by the middle school. So, Mayor, we've issued a purchase order to have that tree replaced. What happened to it? It just died. Died. Just died. Okay. That happened to you know. <laughs> So. <laughs> So the, the other thing is, is um, um, the, the, the red lights, I, I went up there, I, I go to 
Clark and I go to Clark and Clark Corner quite a bit. I have to go over to Georgia Popka. They come through there, they run them red lights. That's one of the reasons they have wrecks there. They run them red lights. I don't know what it is with people. They just zoom right on through them. My wife and I were there the other day and we watched just one car run that light and went up on Clear Corner Road at the four way light there, run that light. But so you gotta people's gotta see it. They kill somebody or something, then they're gonna wonder. But that's what's gotta happen. They just gotta slow down. But please, somebody pass along to the police to start. If they're speeding, run them a ticket. Somebody yep. needs to be out in those areas. Rob, I don't just know. for general information, Mayor, I, I had that uh, discussion with the chief the other day. It's uh, with the two chiefs actually, and um, you know I think everybody got really bad habits during the pandemic, and they've not dropped yeah. them yet. But the traffic is back to what it yeah. used to be before. So, you know, my comment was to them. Um, I understand they're doing other things, but it's really important right now for all the time that they have, um, and everybody who's laser and radar certified yeah. to be out there and actually writing well, tickets right now. It used now. to be in sections. I don't know what you call it. I think it's sections. There used to be so many officers in each section, and then they had yeah. a call they could go to the other places. But still, they were to be riding around Worst Road, up yeah. on Oakley Hills Road, Fluellen, all those places. And visibility is important, too. Yeah, so, so maybe we can pass that message along. Yeah. All right, beat the journal.